All right. Thank you so much for your patience. Welcome back to God's Foretold Work. Um, it is July 29th, 2023, and I'm going to take a little break from GFW until the convocation and on the starts on the 23rd of August. So we're having a whole bunch of meetings right in a row there. So we're going to take just a little, a little um, sabbatical from meeting together. And um, so anyway, for tonight, still um, trying to find our, trying to find our footing. I, I, the reason I waited so long, I had something on my heart that I was going to ask Reggie to share about, but be, but before I do, um, just going to pray. So Lord, I, I do want to, we want to be sensitive to you, Lord. We want you to share what's on your heart. Or we believe that you want to speak to us. We believe that you are speaking through the person of Christ. Always open our ears to hear what you're saying to us, Lord. Commit this next few hours to you, Lord, and just ask for your the blessing of your presence, the glory of your presence, Lord. Strengthen your people for the coming days. Feed us, Lord. Jesus name. Yes. So mm, go ahead. Just draw back the veil, Lord. Draw back the veil. We want our hearts, Lord. You are God who is ever present help. An ever present him. You're able and you're faithful to speak, Lord, through the scripture and into the hearts, Lord. Father, we just want to be in your presence. Just you're enough, Lord. We only ask that you attend us in all that we undertake. We ask that you be with us tonight. Just you would be present. You would be personally edified in what you would quicken and remind us of contemplations you would direct our hearts into as you as the scripture says direct our hearts into the love of God the unspeakable immense love of God Lord open our eyes the eyes of our understanding and just Lord bring things before us Lord that we haven't even perhaps considered not even planned but just what you would you would touch here and there in your deposit in our brothers and sisters bring forth bring forth Lord and let none of these precious times, what few are left to us, be wasted. We ask in Jesus' name. Yes. So I have heard Reggie speak about something, um, bits and pieces over the years. And uh, one of it, one of the one of those instances was, was was fairly recent. Like it might have been in a GFW, it might have been in a might have been in a personal conversation. I, I can't remember, but it's something about um, uh, when Reggie was in Mexico as a young man um, on a mission trip is what I understand. And he, he, he had a vision. And um, anyway, I, I, I'm not hundred percent sure why I, why I would like you to share about that, Reggie, but I, I, I would like to get the, the 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 story, and I don't I don't want you to rush through it. I mean, you know, you can set the context or whatever, and and then then we can move on to whatever else. But I, I just want that's kind of been uh, something I've wanted to just get out there in the 
you know, in the open for a, a little while. So, okay, let me give you a little background of it. And uh, most of you have heard my review of the story of the back over the backyard fence, where I, after a time of crisis and glorious resolution and just the excitement of what the Lord was beginning to open up in the scriptures through a real crisis. I've, I've discussed it elsewhere. I think uh, it, it's called an anatomy of a revelation. I reviewed some of that and I think Dalton captured it. It's might be on our website. I'm not sure. It's Chicken on Mr. Yes, it is. Mr. Israel of YouTube uh, channel. And so over the backyard fence and so forth and the, and the, and the brother there that I would end up uh you know, he's a railroad engineer. I would spend many hours with him on the railroad at all hours of the morning. I forgot exactly why I was even able to do that. Because, uh, but actually, I was still living with my parents next door to me. And uh, in my early days, this is before children or anything had come. And so, um, I, well, actually, actually, one one of my, my oldest daughter had come. But um, we had... Uh, all these things were opening up to me. And I actually recall distinctly getting on my knees and saying, Lord, I know you don't want us to depend on man or trust a man, but if anyone else has seen these things, would you please give me a man, someone that has seen these things and fellowship with me in these things? Well, it wasn't literally 30 minutes or an hour. I found myself over my backyard fence talking to my next door neighbor who I had some endearment towards, you know, but again, I thought he was another basically Christian tradition, definitely a Christian, but, you know, I didn't know much about his understanding of things. And over that fence, uh, he let me know he was the only one in his church who actually believed these things. And what, what do I mean by these things? I'm talking about the end times, Israel, the Antichrist, all that, but had the view as I did in my, as I recount in that early uh, video that you know, anatomy of the revelation is called, uh, had the view that uh, the Antichrist comes first and that the saints will be in the tribulation and so forth. And he was the only one in his whole church. It was a large, large church there that had that view. And he talked to his pastor and others about it and met with some, you know, gracious tolerance at best, uh, basically indifference and dismissal. So, uh, I had not, not long after that began going to a little church called Berean Baptist Church where Ed Branch, a moody graduate, a precious, precious man of God. They were, um, they were printing scriptures and giving them to Jewish people throughout the city and everywhere. And they were strong believers in having independent printing presses uh, that would save a lot of money and so forth. And they were doing that. And some other churches were doing that. And, um, he was real, real committed to Jewish evangelism. And I met three spinsters there. They were older sisters that were in their advanced years. There's something like out of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, those three ladies. Uh, one was Miss Blanny, Miss, Miss Icy, and I forgot the other dear one's name. But they wrote tracks. They were brilliant women. I don't know why. None of them were married, but they were anointed. And they had such a heart for Israel. I ended up falling right in with them. And, and um, you know, Miss Blanny literally led one well-known rabbi at Fort Worth to the Lord. And many Jewish people, my wife, Connie, would sometimes visit these Jewish homes in, uh, with, with Miss Blanny. And so I uh, also say that I'm, I'm with my friend now, and he's a mentor, the, 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 you know, the one we call the beloved Mr. Morton who Travis Knowles and James Bergeron, some of those people that were with him and me in those days back in Texas. This is before we ever heard of our cats or anything like that. And we were already moving towards community. In fact, early on there would have a community in Texas. Um, so um, what, what, bring, what brought me to Mexico was uh, I had made friends and learned of uh, some people that were in uh, Mr. Morton's church there in Fort Worth. Uh, and, and one of them was named Don Frazier, and he's with a ministry called Bearing Precious Seeds. And they'd met us young guys, and we were real zealous, you know, and, and uh, we we're committed to, you know, seeing the word of God given to people and so forth. They're going down to Mexico. So we kind of agreed to go and 
uh, with, this is with my next door neighbor's church, not my church, which was another part of town. And so when I was down there, I uh, met Roscoe Brewer, who was at that time like kind of a right-hand man and, and part of the mission wing of Thomas Road Baptist Church of Lynchburg, Virginia, which is famous for the Jerry Falwell Moral Majority. This was before Moral more Majority, of course. And so uh, I met him down there and we were um, with him. And at, at that, there was a discussion that went on about, uh, about moving away from these independent uh, printings of the Bible to using the commercial litho presses and so forth to do it you know, much less expensively and just far more practical, more economic. And I was uh, appealing to the brothers both of these men were men I looked up to and they're substantial missionary leaders. And um, I was appealing to them about the need to hang on to some access to independent printing because the day may well come and who knows when, but will come when, uh, you know, the church will have access to a lot of this commercial act, you know, printing and so forth. And, uh, I recall Roscoe Brewer said, well, you know, I'm not a theologian, I'm practical or something like that. And then being the young whippersnapper that I was, I said, well, Paul was both theologian and practical, you know, in other words. And then the other brother, this is kind of what set the mood and the experience that I had in Mexico. And you can take it from there. But the other brother, who I really looked up to, kind of cut, cut rather short and said, this is why we can't work with you, young brothers, because of this post-trib obsession of yours and so on, and it really struck me. And so later I was in a car in the back seat and I was looking straight across to my right side to a large protruding mountain in, a, in an otherwise kind of desolate desert, like not totally desert, but just scrub brush and all. But out of the middle of Mexico was this opposing mountain that just went right up. It wasn't a super high mountain, it was really imposing, all by itself kind of mountain. And Truth be known, I never had read Zechariah 4 or anything about the mountain. And actually, as I was looking at that mountain, the Lord spoke to me, obviously not audibly, but clearly, distinctly, that that mountain was that brother in front of me. And it would be made a plain. And I didn't, or made, made level, it would be moved. And we would have unity. There would be unity in the future between us who had these sharp differences among brethren. So I was seeing a time in the future by the spirit when we would come to a unity of the faith. And a lot of these imposing obstructions in our fellowship and in our trust and in our teaching, for that matter, would be made level. And I saw a clear vision of the two witnesses in Jerusalem. And there was like two signs kind of looming in the air. One said, this is the last generation. And the other one said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now, I'd seen those signs elsewhere. But all of a sudden, here they were in this vision. And it was in the days of the two witnesses. And I'm going to couple another vision that came a little bit later, or experience rather. But it coincides very, very well here. So. This later, I would go home after a, a, a real experience. I could that might not be something I need to really add, but I'd go home, and some couple of weeks later, I ran across Zechariah four, which talks about this mountain that is before its rubble would be made a plain. And of course, you could take that mountain to be symbolic of world power, or Babylon, or Satan, or whatever, or, or the world system, or all that's all that's opposing, hindering, holding back the kingdom of God. And it would be made plain by, not by human assistance, or, but not by might or by power, but by my spirit. And so uh, I left there. I would learn later a little bit more of what that could mean. But I left there believing that there is coming a, a unity to the body of Christ. Where, But it's coming late along. It's coming down the line. Uh, it was on the day's of or before the, or at the tribulation when we know from the scriptures the two witnesses so i'm just uh maybe a day or so later i'm in a kind of a tourist type bus we're going through the sharp sharp mountains of mexico there and 
I had passed by um, uh, a long procession of young Hispanic young children, and they had their crosses and all their flowers and everything. And I knew it was very religious. And we were there witnessing in the mountains to these Catholic peasants and people. And um, that's what we were doing like at night and so forth with these films that they put up. And, and, um, and so as we saw them walking and so forth, or I did, the Lord just smote my heart with, uh, with compassion. And uh, I was just thinking, what's it going to take? Uh, and again, I was confronted with that same vision of the days of the two witnesses. Now, remember, the two witnesses are not just about two witnesses, about the anointing and the, the power that's coming on the church. And I say, I'm not even sure I knew that much of that, that at that time. But somehow in my spirit, that kind of went together with this is not just those two guys, but it's a time of great transition when the world will see the miraculous and the miraculous fulfillment of prophecy and the gospel will take wings as it never has before. Uh, we know that from Revelation 14, 6, that in the days just before the harlot is judged, there's a great release of the gospel that happens at that time. And that corresponds, of course, with Matthew 24, 14, other places about a, a great harvest. Well, I don't know how much of the scripture I even knew. It's hard to recall. But I had the deep sense that in the days of the witnesses, I saw like dominoes going down, like a, a, a wind of the spirit. And all these peasant mountain people and others we're going to come into the faith, come out of the religious uh, captivity into the liberty of the truth of the faith. And as I saw that, I was just kind of weeping almost effusively. And a, a Baptist brother at a great distance, I think a lot of these missionaries were Baptists at the time. And he spotted me and he came over. He says, I don't know what's in your heart and your eyes right in your, in your spiritual eyes, but it's the Lord. And I don't know if you just say that, but he said, and the Lord gave me three things for you to pray and remember. And he said, pray for, um, oh my goodness, Kevin, I, I know him as like, I know my name. Give me a second here. Pray for a burden and pray for boldness and pray for humility. And put it in that different order. So put, pray for humility, pray for bur a burden and pray for boldness. Okay. And so I kind of think that because I went home and I saw the mountain and Zerubbabel and the two anointed ones and the end times and all that. I've always believed that the vision wasn't just for me, but it's for the body of Christ. And later, quite a bit later, and I've shared this before at the conferences, it's quite amazing that at the same time in Daniel 11, 30, uh, 31 and 32 and 33, right at the time the abomination is being placed, which we know marks the middle of the last three and a half years. Uh, the last seven marks the beginning of the last three and a half years that a great anointing power and might and strength is going to come on the people of God. And a number of scriptures show this. And there's a great evangelism at that time. Though, though they that be wise that receive this at that time are also going to turn many to righteousness. And so it goes together with seeing those dominoes going down and not just Mexico, but wherever throughout the world, common everyday people, there's going to be a massive revival. That the Lord is going to, just before he closes the curtains on this age and brings the final uh, convergence and fullness of wickedness in this man of sin and those that follow him, he's also going to be releasing a final full ingathering of, of evangelism. Now, I know the millennium's coming and there's going to be evangelism in the millennium, so I'm not saying that everything terminates here. There's a lot of things that carry on into the millennium, but the great harvest of souls such as cannot be numbered humanly, not just spread out all over the inter-advent period during a time of general tribulation and the world will have tribulation, but this is the tribulation, the great one in the literal translation. This is that literal condensed, intensive, uh, uh, unparalleled time. So at the same time, the two witnesses are receiving power. We see clear evidence that the masculine or those, that's just anyone that's born again, really, the, the, those that have this light of the gospel, and have something of an understanding are going to be waxing strong and doing great exploits. Well, obviously, we're talking something swinging back to the power of Pentecost here. And there's other scriptures I could bring in and things we can reflect on and support. Uh, a lot of things come together here. But the bottom line is we're going to be visited with a great gift. There's going to be an outpouring. What for all the all the ominous 
portent and fearful implications of, a, of embarking on that final tribulation. What is going to really greatly offset that is in many regards, it's going to be one of the church's greatest hours because it's going to be a reaping of souls all over the world like we've never seen. And it's at great cost. It's in rivers of blood, but it's going to be incredible in its glory and power to bring people all the way out and out of the comfort zones and the power of the flesh and all into a crisis that will, will, will bear incredible, an incredible amount of fruit. So that's the, the vision I had. And that was before the Lord even opened up the things about the mystery of lawlessness, all the things he's added to me. And that started me on about a one and a half to two year download that most of all that I believe today up to and including issues of the gospel, things that are not just exactly related to prophecy, but the things that the Lord really established in my life that had really been nothing so much, not so much added to it over these many, many years, but a refinement and a strengthening to support those things that he revealed. Because he kind of promised me that every time he would show me something that would be by revelation, he would give me the supporting evidence from scripture. So that no one's saying, thus saith the Lord, without a clear case from Scripture. So the things that are most precious to me and my calling and the things that were part of my beginnings that would be formative for what would become something of a ministry or a, or a, or a kind of calling would be things that would be supported by comparing Scripture with Scripture and establishing it in the Scripture, not just, you know, so... I hesitate to say the Lord said, the Lord said, or the Lord showed, but there are things that the Lord did reveal that, that the support part came later. And I didn't get out of the book, although I'd later in order in the, in the interest of dealing with all the massive amounts of objections and issues and differences, I would become a little bit of a red person, not necessarily a scholar, formally speaking, but I'd become sort of a lay scholar just because I was dealing with and wanted, because I always loved that quote from Francis Schaeffer that said, apologetics is an enterprise of Christian compassion. And don't we always study to show, you know, in order to help those that didn't oppose themselves and so forth. In other words, I would take pains to learn other positions and other perspectives. And, and it was only because I was trying to get at what, how they were thinking, what would be a, a, a port of entry to, 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 to assist and disabuse uh, of things that would rob the body of vital issues of, of importance. So that's why I became a little bit of a, of a lay scholar, not formally. I didn't even, you know, I don't have a degree. I uh, almost did, but I just, the Lord called me on. But um, so I, I, I just, uh, that was very formative for me. And so I, right after the, th the, the resolution began to come about the crisis that we talked about in the, in the video, uh, that was so wonderfully resolved when I came to Second Thessalonians 2. And then I was over the fence with my back, over the backyard fence with my neighbor. Next thing you know, we're at the railroad at night and having coffee at his house. And it just was off to the races after that. And the Lord would even send other brothers who would be part of that little hamlet of, um, of, of interaction and sharing. And we would see what was all opposed because right away, and I'll close with this. I noticed as soon as the Lord showed me about the Lord's coming, a lot of other things were at issue too, but, but, but particularly the Lord's coming, that it would be after the tribulation and so forth. I realized very soon after that, that that was a rare view. And I thought, why and how would that be a rare view? I'm not talking about all the high, you know, highly finesse details here. I'm just talking about, you know, I loved it one time when I, and I'm not the flatter Fred, but I loved it when he said one time, I'm not so much a timeline guy. I'm a, when you shall see these things kind of guy. I remember he said that. And I like that because I began to see the things that we would all see. If you're a believer, you're going to see these things. You're not going to miss them. And so if you're a believer, so what in the world would obscure these things? And why all the fuss and the fight? Because everywhere I would turn, the church that I grew up in, which was very conservative, but very anti, um, they were really anti-millennial. They were, were very replacement. And uh, everywhere I'd go, I'd either find out that all these events that were so meaningful to me now, and the Lord was opening up to me, especially out of Daniel chapter 11, many places, all of them were had either been adjudicated or, or judged to be in the past, 
either in 165 BC or at 70 AD, but certainly not future. That's your whole gamut of tradition and all. And you'd be surprised how dominant that view is. Actually, really, in terms of world Christendom, that's far more the dominant view than even pre-tribulations. Pre-tribulations is comparatively a, a more minority view. Now, not among our, our circles. We run into more of that because of the Bible Belt and that, both that kind of thing. But, but the pre-trib view is kind of a Johnny come lately to the discussion. And then where I would go over here and find other brethren, many of them very dear, preached a sound gospel, but they were pre-trib. And these things didn't matter. All the things that the Lord has given me didn't matter. Uh, you we either would on millennial. Yeah, either either you're on millennial and, and, and these things have already happened and they are not in the future. Well, there might be trouble in the future uh, for the on millennials. He thinks the tribulation is Antichrist getting out of his or, or Satan being released for his little season. So they have some vague view, but it has little or nothing to do, has nothing to do actually with Judea or, or a literal, literal attack on Jerusalem. That's not even on their, in their, per, their uh, foreview. And then on the other side, the pre-trib brethren believe, you know, these things will happen, but it's on the other side of the rapture and therefore not of immediate relevance to us. It might be good to know, you know, just to make the scriptures fit and God's going to keep his word. To Israel, that's good, but it has nothing to do with us, and that burdened me, and it also put me on to something. There's a there's something going on in the realm of spiritual um, blindness here, and I begin to su suspect that this is spiritual and not just mere academic. And the more I discovered and learned, the more that was confirmed that there is spiritual bias and motivation. All all kinds of things gets into this, and then I saw something else. Despite man's ability to confuse and complicate the otherwise simple and plain, was the sovereignty of God, where God has left in the word some things that you can stumble at rather easily unless you're committed to the whole word. You can find your isolated verses and so forth or your arguments or some scholar is going to study history and see how amazingly parallel some of the activities of, of Antiochus Epiphanes IV was how he was, instead of seeing him as a type of the Antichrist and a, and a partial, uh, more typological fulfillment that didn't follow through and didn't come into the full, he will completely say that completely fulfills the scripture. Even though Jesus himself is going to say this is future, he's going to put it all back in one second because he's got the enlightened ability now to see in the book of Maccabees and in other histories, you know, this, this amazing parallel event. And it is indeed parallel, but a parallel is not a fulfillment. And, and even a partial fulfillment is not an exhaustive or full or complete fulfillment. So this mystery of typology, how things would be blended, was often a source of stumbling. There'd be other sources of stumbling. And I realized unless you search this out as a mystery and by grace, a, a trembling dependence on the Holy Spirit, put the pieces together, God himself had left plenty of room to hang ourselves. If I can be so crude. I mean, it's, there's things in the scripture that you can use against the scripture, even in your good intentions, unless by mercy you escape that tendency to, to depend on, you know, you may have a, a, a wonderful teacher, pastor, mentor, and they may have led you to the Lord. They may have helped you in your marriage. They may have, you know, who knows, but they've also taught something that's not confirmed in the word. Now, it's going to be something so removed from anything in the scripture that it's obvious it's going to be subtle. But because you neglect to prove all things and test all things and you take the word of this trusted person or their sources and what brought them to that conclusion and you don't check it for yourself in trembling dependence on the Holy Spirit, it's on you. It's not on him. It's on you that you're not searching these things out. And God himself is hiding his wisdom from the wise and prudent. It will deliberately elude. I mean, it's set up in a way where it just eludes self-reliance. And self-reliance is a form of pride that's very subtle. It's hard to detect, hard to set. It's so pervasive in our nature. To escape self-reliance is an absolute miracle of grace. Because even the most humble, all shucks kind of people have a very deep built-in self-reliance. It's very hard to detect. You never think of it as pride. It's so common to our nature. Some boastful person, you kind of pick that up right away. But, but the kind of brokenness it takes from God to be open to search things and, with the, and then have the, 
have the grace of believing that God will teach you, that he's not interested in just teaching the teachers. He wants to teach you. He wants this to be your bread, your, your, uh, between you and him. He doesn't want to re- hide his secrets from his friends. From it, and as all the prophets were, were friends. Uh, shall I not show my friend Abraham the thing I do? And he doesn't redo, reveal anything except to his servants, the prophets. And I'm not called you servants, but friends. It's, uh, it's fellowship. It's walking with God and having him reveal to you. Says he he he, he uh, conceals his secret except to those that fear him. He it's it's his mercy to open the scriptures. If you think, oh, I'll just figure this out, and why why can't those idiots see this? Why can they? Why what kind of agenda have they bought into? It's not that easy and not that automatic. Some things are, and and uh, but some things God has let be rather difficult to sort out. That could lead into one of our discussions some other time, but. The prophets saw definite light on things, but until it was God's set time, they couldn't sort it out. They had the true pieces. And so sometimes we have real pieces and we put them together wrong or we're whatever. So it's a delicate matter. It's a spiritual matter. It's not just grab your commentary and see what everyone has said. And maybe, you know, but so that's why I took pains to learn a little bit, not exhaustively, but learn a little bit about what others were saying about these precious things and why they were saying it. What were the obstacles? What were the roadblocks? What were the presuppositions? What was formative in them coming to those conclusions? What scripture text did they cite these? And so you can see some of the how things that were formative in shaping my orientation. You still see today. That's that's how it came about. But it really it, it's a, it was an episode of, of four or five kind of visitations. Some more things would come later on some things that have been really, really part of my my overall perspective and the development of my understanding and vision. But there were about four of these. Uh, I won't even elevate them to visitation. They weren't. But they were definitely a sense of his presence and his uh you know, especially the mountain thing, you know, that was strong. Then to think now, so I said to you today, if I do share anything, this is not my vision. It's not about me. It's about us. It's about the end time servants and saints who are called to this servant calling and who will be participants in a final crisis that will see a multi which no man can number and will perhaps be privy to the very witnesses that will be in Jerusalem. But what, what you see in Jerusalem and yes, they'll have their own special calling and certain things will attend their ministry that will be unique to them, no doubt. Of course, it's clear. But what is, well, what has happened to them has happened to many. There is a, a surge of divine life and wisdom and grace and urgency and, and light and, and, and bold proclamation that is coming to the many. And I think that's where we're going to see the body come into a unity of understanding. A lot of people are going to be disabused of a lot of their presumptions. There'll be some deep repentance, some deep recovery. And I think you're going to see a church that's been somewhat embarrassed, exposed, their own pride um, decimated. And it's that church that will be speaking to Israel in, in great anointing and great boldness. A church that's been wrong, a church that's been anemic, a church that's been, you know, in many ways, There'll be plenty around us to see many that are falling, which means to say, just like Israel fell, there'll be plenty of our of, of world Christendom that will fall and succumb and, and not, not be able to persevere in such a great test. So it's like, what's he shutting us up to? Not by might, nor by power. It's the whole Bible in a few words. The whole Bible is just not by might or by power, but by my spirit. So I see us as being brought, that's why to me, the first half of the week is so transitional, so key, so critical. If that's neglected, dismissed, ignored, or denied, and it's not seen for, to be invested in packed with all that God has invested in it, because I think all together with why we are, what and what, what we will be from the middle of the point, middle point of the week on through to the end, part of everything coming, that during that interlude, that, that three and a half year period, that's going to be our moment to get on the same page, to be moved by an urgency of, of, of desperate uh, urgency to come into the into all that, that we have been slow to come into and to 
hopefully see a lot of uh, the errors that have shot through the church and, and, and weakened it and ill-prepared it and disarmed it for what's coming, to see a lot of that come under uh, God's deep dealing as that deep, intensive conversation comes about within the body of Christ, you know, uh, and so that we can be to Israel that voice. It's going to have all to do with the deep divesting and emptying out of the self-sufficiency of the of the so-called again you know this isn't just apostate world christendom god has no covenant with him but i'm talking about the body of christ like a friend one of fred's favorite verses not favorite but it's just one of the most important verses to fred is that judgment must begin at the house of god don't think that we're going to go into this and have all the answers and be ready for israel unless we have passed through something of the same divine weakening and you know and, and and being cast upon the mercy of the lord uh and being deeply judged deeply refined not just in the tribulation days while we're having the overt physical persecutions but in that deep sifting of soul and spirit that goes on under the uh, magnifying glass of god's searching judgments when you know you're about to face the ultimate goliath and you dare not go out to meet him in your own strength. That's going to drive the believing people who can begin to conceive, uh, you know, when a sacrifice has started and some things have begun to close in and really open the discussion. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of movement. And it may take some of the early days of the tribulation itself to really bring about some, uh, uh, you know, bringing the body on onto the same page and i don't mean everybody of course i mean that those living members of the living body of christ the pillar and ground of truth that kind of thing not 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 christendom or the vague uh tear wheat thing going on i'm talking about god's elect people they're going to be brought to a place of fullness and of obedience that they would not have come to corporately speaking without the constraints and inducements that that first half of the week is going to supply Maybe not only there, maybe some happen now, some happens in the early time after the abomination. But in that area, in that area, I believe we're going to see that man in the front seat, so to speak, come into agreement with me and me and with him. In other words, the Lord is going to iron out some of these impasses and uh, you know, obstruct uh, roadblocks in the unity of the body. So. I really appreciate a lot of what Shimon last week said about unity. Unity is really precious in the sight of the Lord. Unity is really a rare, uh, not not a natural thing. You can buddy buddy and you know get along and have doctrinal agreement, but real unity of the spirit doesn't come cheap, and it's a, it's a precious commodity uh, for serving the Lord and hearing the Lord together. In those days. Any questions about what when? Whatever, any further? No, that was good. You can see Rob, it looks like Rob has something. Well, I was just, as you were speaking, I was just thinking of this psalm, or part of this psalm 25, where David says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in justice and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. But just that he leads the humble in justice and teaches the humble his way. You know, there's just a lot in the prophets about that. You know, the scripture in Zephaniah, I think it is, um, seek righteousness seek humility, perhaps you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. You know, those, just the, the premium being on the Lord teaching the humble his way. You know, it's, it's um, yeah, it's a day. If, if there's any day, it's now. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. You know, it's, um, like I, I admit I struggle in where I fellowship because they're just as, you know, really, um, no real grid for these things. And I mean, I know you guys know what I mean because we've all struggled with that. And it's it's just it's just hard because 
Um, not only does the conversation not really get underway with the leadership, but be because it's not preached, you know, nobody in the congregation really either is is in tune with with these things. It's just difficult um, because. But anyway, in spite of all that, it's like it's. I know the Lord wants to teach me, you know, in, in this fashion, you know, he leads the humble in justice and teaches the humble his way. Um, you know, to be blameless as a dove, to be blameless as a dove in these days, it's just, uh, anyway, that's, that's what I was thinking about as I was listening to, you you know, this premium on humility, perhaps you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Everything high, everything exalted. Uh, what is it? Uh, Isaiah 2. Yeah. Every high thing. Lord everything Lord. that can be shaken. And the only thing God's interested in shaking are high things. Things that exalt. Things that are self-sufficient. But wherever there it is, even in nature, where there's a natural dependence on God. There might be death, but there's, not a, there's no wrath. But where, uh, where there's pride, there's wrath, there's exposure, yeah. there's danger. Because, you know, so it's a call to flee from the wrath to come. And where you're fleeing? Into Christ. But whatever coming into Christ means, whatever justification, whatever right, whatever that means, you can be very sure it means a despair of man. Mm -hmm. See she from man whose breath is in his nostril. Whatever it means. Why if you've got the right version of it, you may have a wrong version and, and survive, but whatever it means, it will reduce you in a moment. First of all, seeing him as he is, which is 2 Corinthians 3.18, that's how we're changed. That immediately annihilates you. You may be joyous in that vision, and you, you will be, but it will at the very same time be utterly exposing your destitution. You'll know, you'll know not to depend anymore on you. Uh, on on and, and 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 how much is this like lacking uh it's not just it's and, and those that rely on themselves it's amazing how much they rely on others you know uh, god can't teach me but they can teach me really it, it, how do you know he taught them see what i'm saying so really a humble a humility to know that man is just unreliable all men all men the best of men. And so God is going to hold you accountable for any dependency you've had on others to be your teacher. It says in 1 John 2, I think it's 27. Can you throw that up, Tom? 1 John 2, 27. Everybody talks about church fathers. I know Charles, Paul said, you know, you have not many fathers. And there's such a thing as a church father, in other words, a shepherd and so forth. But it also says, call no man father, doesn't it? As God's very jealous about your source here, folks. I mean, and even your resources, which are given from God, must be handled with great care and holy fear. Because you can start to let a resource become a source. Right? Look at that. These things I've written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which have, you have received of him abides in you. And you do not need that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, he's truth, he's no lie. And even as it is, as it, that is the anointing has taught you, you shall abide in him. Or if the it should be translated he, if it's the Holy Spirit, but if, if it means the Spirit's anointing, I guess it's it. But he has taught you, you shall abide in him and so on. So, so we're to have what some have called the priesthood of the believer. We're to have a godly dependency on on. Um, uh, on the scripture, giving it absolute priority, we're to respect and receive with gratitude the resources that we have in teachers and other gifts. But we're 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 to be careful to prove all things. We're to be Bereans, and we're not to. Uh, uh, and if someone may hit the ball 88, 99 times, right? You have to be on the alert for that one time that that wonderful resource doesn't hit it right. Because you're going to be accountable, not for what he said, but for what you, what you received on the presumption 
that it didn't need to be, you know, what did Joshua get in trouble for? Uh, it was by f- relying on appearances and not consulting the Lord. So when it comes to the, especially the truth of God and doctrine of God, uh, it's so important that there be a, uh, not this aw shucks kind of humility, but a, a real deep humility. That, you know, the only thing you're going to get through man is what God almost forces through because we are not just, we're, we're a hostile environment by nature. We, we, we have a, a built in natural and so, um, and then the, the jealousy to, to be sure you're getting it by the spirit and not just secondhand. It's a delicate thing because you do want to respect and appreciate the gifts that God gives the church. That's, that's huge. But you also don't want to be dependent on that as though that absolves you from proving all things and from knowing that he's the one teaching it. He may have stirred it by another brother or sister or whatever, or he may have been you may have had a catalyst but at the at last and at length it's got to be him confirming it by his spirit making it dear to you making it yours it can't be Saul's armor it's got to be yours and to me that's all about a god-given humility not something you're going to resolve and and attain just through your monastic discipline not taking from that there's a place for that but it's not going to come by by human ability you know it's going to come by a gift of God. And most importantly, it's going to come when you tremble at the fact that you're never going to get there without his intervention. You're not going to come to the place where I remember one time with me, and this was a, a bit of the beginning with me too. I had, of course, right away, uh, I never was a reader at all. I had very little. I might have read a comic book or two, but I never was a reader. But when I got saved, I was a voracious reader. I went to the bookstore and I ruined us financially i mean i had books all over the place and um as freaking my wife out you know and, and i and and i just kept struggling and i i just fell on the lord one day i just fell upon him i said all these books conflict and the, the monks and the monasteries conflict it where is the truth it's a jungle out there lord you know that i mean how can i i could go into a monastery i knew and fast away my life and come out a raving heretic absolutely every happens all the time and I could fall in with this group, the Franciscans or the, the Augustinians or who you name it. And I just I just cried out, Lord, unless, unless, unless you're my teacher, I'm done for. I'll, I'll learn some things. But if it's not you, it won't stand up. It won't stand the test and it won't it won't see me through. And I I was in that craze. And I even I even got rid of my entire library. I don't even think I sold it. I just gave it. I don't know what I did with it, but I got rid of it. Now, later, I'd buy books again. But but for a while there, I didn't have anything but my Bible and and uh, depending on the Holy Spirit. And he really taught me. He really taught me. I mean, he did. I, I'm not saying I've got it all right. Check me out too. check out anyone. But he taught me when I came to a despair of me even using great tools to get at the things which he has hidden from the wise and prudent. But what does he reveal it to? Faithfully? To babes. To babes. So whatever it takes to be a babe, you want to be a babe. You want to cry out to God to make you a babe. To divest you and free you and extricate you from every codependent thing that is not to his glory that he's established. In. So I'm sorry for these long exhortations that went on too long. But um the same anointing abides in us and he is our teacher. And when we're desperate and the body's going to be desperate when they start seeing the jigs up and we're in the beginning of the seven years and it's coming quick and there's no stopping it, that, that inexorable approach of, of that antichrist time is at the door. I'll tell you, there's going to be some people and it's not a morbid un, unhappy thing. It's a glorious thing. They're going to start, you know, not digging in the ground, but digging in the spirit. They're going to start digging down putting in their foxhole in the realm of the spirit start getting dug in for the for the big for the big uh, exchange so every time we find ourselves weakened and against the wall and so forth that's that's the beautiful design of god to uh prepare us for another great uh usually uh 
even though there's some discipline in it, there's always some judgment in God's corrections and his preparations of heart. So don't be don't be shocked. But it's preparing us to receive. And the deeper that emptying out is, the deeper the preparation for the greater the receiving of the greater of the greater provision and, and supply. So don't be surprised if he weakens you in some mysterious way. It's to it's to prepare you that he could give you more. And open up other things to you and make familiar things become extremely not new to you, but precious to you, more precious. You know, you can know a lot of things and they're not as precious as after you've gone, come through some fire. And those very familiar things all of a sudden take on a whole new preciousness. Uh, the, it, it's this kind of more, more, more alive to you, more real to you. So even, even Christian daily Christian discipline or those episodes of Christian discipline are designed of God to uh, extricate and free us more and more uh, to that simplicity of dependency on him. That, that, that gift of trust. And it's in those fires that we find out how many other things we trusted, right? And uh, they get exposed, but not to our destruction, but to our help, to our liberation. So, so uh, more here or, or where to from here? Good question. Right. It's, it, it reminds me of this, Reggie, what you're saying just now. Of, uh, he said, actually, my utmost for his highest for today. He says, is it not true to say that God wants to teach us something in our trials through every cloud he brings our way? He wants us to unlearn something. His purpose in using the cloud is to simplify our beliefs until our relationship with him is exactly like that of a child. Relationships simply between God and our own souls, where pe other people are but shadows, till other people become shadows to us. Clouds and darkness will wow. be ours every once in a while. Is our relationship with God becoming more simple than it has ever been? That's uh, this, this, that's amazing. Till our relationship with God get that becomes more simple. I think if the end times are anything, they're about reducing us to utter simplicity in our faith. Yeah. Absolute, utter, you know, simplicity. And it's it's going to be amazing. It's not going to be the, the it's not going to be a big war between all the theological positions. It's going to be an amazing simplicity of you know trusting in Jesus, yeah, and, and having no other stay. You know, yeah, I'm not there, but I know that's where He's taken us, and um, it's, it's uh, sobering because it, it, it's 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 uh, it's some costly disciplines and so forth, but. Uh, I love it where he said, you know, he, he brings us to simplicity there. And I think it was uh, Chambers and other place. He takes the imagery of how the Lord comes in clouds. That's this one. That's this Is it that one? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Says, and he takes almost the imagery of the second coming. Yeah. It's just two more paragraphs to there. It just okay. he says there's yeah. a connection between the strange or providential circumstances allowed by God and what we know of him. We have to learn to interpret the mysteries of life in the light of our knowledge of God until we can come face to face with the deepest, darkest fact of life without damaging our view of God's character. We do not yet know him. And then it, he quotes, they were fearful as they entered the cloud, Luke 934. Is there anyone except Jesus in your cloud? If so, it will only get darker until you get to the place where there is no one anymore but only Jesus. Yeah. This issue, uh, Rob, of the knowledge of God, really, you almost want to say this about a number of other issues, but it's one of the issues you want to almost say is the issue. Yeah. It's certainly a watershed reality issue because um, there's so much knowledge about God and knowledge of God yeah. concerning God. Uh and it's full of truths and truisms, and it's accurate. And no, 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 uh, 
Nothing can be said, but it's 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 still short of the glory of God, unless it's an intimate knowledge of God. Because right. when it says, you know, they that do know their God, right. should be strong to do exploit. That's a very narrow word. Doesn't know all about God. It's not. It's they that do know the end time line of events. No, no, no. They that do know their God, it's and not just those who understand. Revelation. And debated issues of prophecy. That's not what it means. They that understand among the people. That the, the rest way to understand is, is he has given us an understanding right. to know him. And see, this is the, the, the issue, the make and break thing. And the trials find this out, the shaking, the, the judgment, Fred, that begins at the mount at the house of God. This is what it's all about. Do you know him? No question that you know a lot about him. You may have aspirations to know more about him, but God is bringing us to know him. Amen. And I, I, it's just, it's a, it's a rare thing. It's a straight gate. This issue of divine re regeneration isn't saying a prayer. It's a revelation Amen. that changes you, right. that, that up, up ends you, that divests you. And, uh, and what's going to find out whether you've had that revelation or not is, uh, like Matthew 13, you're going to go through some things, uh, you know, persecution for the word, different thing. It's going to find out whether that faith is born of God or of good intentions and of, of, of being a very pliable personality. Obviously, I don't want to go to hell. So let me hold your hand and ask Jesus in my heart. And let me go find a church and get baptized and all that. You know what? That's all good and well. But do you know the Lord? And to say that is, have you seen him? I love Fred Smith. He's that time. Have you seen him? Have you seen him as he is? That's revelation. That's the rock, not Peter's right, correct confession or verses, mm -hmm. but the revelation that didn't come to you by flesh and blood. That's going to put you on a rock that the gates of hell is not going to get. Mm -hmm. There is a difference. And so to make sure of that is what I consider making your calling election sure. It's not just checking your pulse to see how well you've been walking lately or how good you are at your sanctification or how much you've avoided and how much you've done. It's do you know him? You know yes. his heart, you know, and you're led by his spirit. They are the sons of God. What does that mean? Led by the spirit, not led by doctrine. Though there is doctrine, making nothing light of that. The, the spirit is full of correct and true doctrine, but and you're and and they're really true doctrines only going to be arrived at by the spirit but even when the spirit himself gives you that doctrine you can't lean on that you lean on the lord you can't even lean on the things he's given he can't you can't lean on the gifts he's given you there's gonna be some people with some pretty impressive gifts he's gonna say i don't know you you know i you go wait a minute can god gives i don't know i'm not gonna explain all that to you but i know one thing paul talked about having some serious gifting but not having love and what have you got? Nothing. No thing. So there is a fine line here. We had a Judas that walked for three and a half years with the Lord. And he never knew the Lord. He knew from the beginning who, who would betray him and who believed not. And others, you know, I, you know, you're clean, but not there's one of you that's not. Oh, oh, that goes. The guy was outside of the life of God right there while he's with God. He's, he's, he's when the scripture about except you abide in me and I in you, you like a branch will be broken off exactly after the Lord said that Judas got up to go betray him in the chronology of the gospels. That's exactly when he rose up right after the parable about uh, those that are in the vine, but not in the life of the vine. See what I'm saying? So, so this is something you want to not presume about. You want to be sure you know him. And that's not just, uh, you know, use the means of grace, but tremble lest you come short of knowing him. That's where the vital life is. That's what's going to see you through the test. That which is born of God overcomes the world. You know why? Because nothing else will. So that's that's the test. And, the, and that's the line of demarcation between the falling away and the perseverance and the overcoming. Or so I'm persuaded. If anyone feels something should be added, that I, I appreciate it. But I, I, that's that's where I've come in my reading and so forth. That, that you know, I 
it, it's you know, there's a continual and then even those that know the Lord literally know the Lord there's got to be a continual watching lest they come to no use Paul said I I will I I be beat my body keep it under subjection lest I be a castaway in the in the Greek world um you had two you in the Hebraic view you had a castaway was like a pot or a pot that had 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 some crack or whatever fall into disuse it was tossed into a a, a, a pile but but more often into the Greeks like the Corinthians that Paul was addressing there was a common understanding that you had um, in the Greek games, you could actually win the race, but be disqualified by breaking some of the rules of the race. Yeah. And in that you would not be crowned. They would have the Olympic crown. And so the common word for castaway that Paul used, I've learned this in dictionaries and so forth, was the common idea of, of uh, breaking the rules of the race and being disqualified. So Paul said, I do all these things, but if I don't do them by love, see, love is the rule of the race. I can run this thing. And if, even if I came out in front, if it's if I'm not running by the rule of love, I get disqualified. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So to me, more than the Hebraic use of a broken pot, I think Paul's talking there about uh, the analogy of, of a race uh, in, in, the, in the Greek mind and in, in view. A disqualification so you know the the trembling what what, what a what a price to pay for negligence and you know a lack of vigilance and a lack of sobriety that we should not run this race and and, and finish our course uh, uh and that we would we would have to give account and actually have loss wood hay and stubble or disqualification from the crown right so there's a so even when you know the Lord, there's still a continual fight, a continual quest. Yeah. I remember one time uh, at a Bible study I was at uh, here in Winnipeg. There was a couple there. You know them, right? Fred and Dina Herrera. And, oh, I know them well. Sure. And um, I remember sharing some things afterwards with Fred, just that are things I was struggling with. And his answer at the time puzzled me. Um, well, puzzled maybe is not the right word, but it didn't seem helpful at the time because it didn't give me the magic bullet, right? <laughs> he, he, just, he just said to me, it's a continual cry now to God. You know, wow. just a few words, because he's not a man of many words, it seems, but just... Oh, he wasn't. I never forgot that it's a continual crying out to God. And it's taken me years to appreciate that, but that's at the heart of the heart of our dependency. I love, I love that man. I know I, I really love Fred Herrera. Yeah. He's and, still living. Last I heard, uh, we were yeah. wanting him. We go down to, to, to Fort Worth, the Dallas, where my kids are. I was wanting to go out and see him, and he lives over, used to live over in Oak Cliff. Dina has gone on home to be with the Lord, but Fred is still, and Fred used to always be the sick one. I remember often praying. I love him so much. I pray he had a leg issue that was really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you, would, you would have never thought that he would outlive Dina with all his help, but here he is. <laughs> he's very advanced in years. Yeah. Fred, he's, it's, you know, such a helpless and a, a true statement, you know, a continual yeah. crying. A to continual go. crying. I, 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 it didn't satisfy wow. me at the time because I wanted a fix, you know. I wanted a quick fix, yeah, right. But, Peter, yeah. You know, Paul said, who is sufficient for these things? I've, yeah. I've said or tried to say something to this effect, and probably others have said it better, but if we're not crying out with Paul daily, who is sufficient for these things? We're not seeing much. Maybe not seeing anything because when you see what we're up against and how I love Spurgeon's statement at the end of his wonderful little pamphlet that he wrote for soul winners, it was called uh, all of grace. It was a great little track that he wrote just for those who were struggling to be, to find the Lord and all. And at the end of it, he said, our perseverance will be through the wonderment of the angels. This isn't a shoe in automatic shoe in. It's a, the perseverance of the believer is an, a, a miracle, given what we're up against. 
And so if we're not saying who is sufficient for these things, are we really seeing the battle, the war, or the glory of the preservation through that war? You're going through a minefield here. They're wise, they're wise principalities and powers that are much smarter than you. And they know you better than you know yourself. Who is sufficient for these things? And then your task. What about your task? What about your, your trust in the Lord, the things you've been given? Oh, if I had to agree over anything, it's my lack of attendance to my trust, what God's given. And so, you know, who is sufficient is, is our cry. And that constant cry is, is our desperation. And I'll tell you, our desperation is our best friend. Right. Oh, yes, I, I take that back. The promises of God, the, the knowledge of his faithfulness and the experience, the, the experience that works hope. Oh, boy, that's huge. But I would say all along the way, you know, second only to that is the desperation that we feel in our own flesh. And one of the greatest mercies of God is to protect you from yourself by not giving you the things that you want and wish and will yeah. after the flesh. And I don't mean bad things. They can actually be good things, but he's not letting you have those aspired good things. He has something perfect. It was Art Katz. I love his quote. The greatest enemy of the perfect is the good. Good And what do we see in the church settling for less? And by less, I don't mean less, you know, big, big works for God that are even powerful and even help a lot of people. I mean, less of him. I must decrease, but he must increase. We settle for less of him. And when we do that, uh, there is loss. And uh, but I woke up the other morning and uh, two scriptures came to mind. Well, one's not a scripture. But I woke up how that Israel is going to be the servant nation because they're going to they're have in them what Paul had in him. When you, you've heard this, this song, Oh, Grace, How Great a Debtor, to Grace, How Great a Debtor, yeah. the gospel. I thought, if anyone's got the gospel, this, this is an indictment to me. This is a, all of us. If we really got the gospel to the degree that it can be got, it can be had, it can be apprehended and received, not only does it make you a debtor to all men, it liberates you to, to have, have a freedom to give. And an availability, you know, so freely you've received, freely give. I thought Israel's going to be a debtors to all men. They're going to be debtors to the nation, nations. Their, their kind of rule is not this domineering kind of rule. It's a rule, although God will dominate for them, there's going to be a, a requirement of the nations. I got that. But, but they're going to have a servant's heart that's going to feel themselves debted to the, indebted to the nations. And, and that brokenness and that contrition that's with them at the beginning, the marvel of the millennium is it stays with them. It doesn't fade away with the next generation. That broken beginning stays with them. And they remain that faithful light to the nations, which is really the image of the servant, the suffering servant, which now they bear in the, in the, in the, in the power of the spirit to the nations. And so being a debtor to all men, and then the other thing, thing that came to me the, that morning it was actually yesterday not this morning but yesterday morning no it was thursday morning the thing that came to me was love goes the distance and i thought about a mother going through a dangerous minefield or whatever it took whatever it took to take care and to rush to the need of her child and i thought when we love god as we should love god it's not us it's God's love in us that's going to go the distance. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, uh, you, 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 love doesn't fail, right? But what kind of love? The love of God. Yeah. And where is that? The shed abroad in the heart by the Holy Spirit. Right. Give us the love of God, shed abroad in the, our heart in the Holy Spirit. And you're going to have a sense and a quiet in your heart. That though you don't minimize or diminish the things you're up against, the improbability, the, the incredible obstacles, you're going to know in your heart you're going to go the distance because the love of God is going to go the distance. You're going to have something in you that has a built-in persevering principle built right into it. And it's going to be resilient. You could knock it back a bit, but it's going to bounce back. 
because it's God. It's rather to say it's the word of God in you. He's the real overcomer here. And, and, and as we are in union with him, partaking of his divine nature, we're going to overcome. See, uh, love goes the distance. And love, especially gospel love, gospel liberation kind of love, makes us debtors to all men. All men. Not just your view of the elect or something like that, but all men. You're debtors to all men. You're not just debtor to the, the Republicans. You're debtors to the Democrats. You're debtors to all men, the losers and the winners and the down and the out. Man, you know, debtors to all men. It's just like, if God can do this for me, there ain't no sinner so dead that he can't make, say live, right? That's, that's, that should be our view, I think. Fred, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. How about you? how about it, brother? Anything? Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, our our troops are are, are uh, strangely absent tonight. Usually, we have some brothers that chiming in. Adam's tied up tonight. A dear stately couple from Canada's visit with him and Cheryl. I forgot who else I heard from tonight that can't make it. Uh, we were having a conversation before you got here. Um, we were talking. We had we had started talking about what you know. As I was asking Fred what he was going to discuss, and the Holocaust came up, and of course, I don't, I don't want Fred to have to give his message now. But Rob was saying, and this kind of stood out to me, that. Apparently, you went to Yad Vashem, Rob, and yes. and when you first walked in, there was a pillar there. That if you would, if you could recount what you saw, yeah, what you saw. A stand about four feet high with a you know plaque on it, some some writing, well printing, just giving a brief kind of a very brief statement about what. The Jews have experienced at the hands of the church over the centuries. You know, and of course, that being a negative, you know, in, in history, it's true. But it, to me, it was a little off putting at the very, you know, front door of this museum that um, they're blaming another agency, you know another agency for for what they've experienced not that there's not a lot of historical truth in what um what what that statement you know but like, like when, it could be blaming the babylonians or the assyrians or the greeks right. or the medes That's, and persians yeah yeah but there was well as art's title of his book or subtitle where was god oh. On and on. You know, you know, so that was just a bit off putting right off the top to be greeted with that as soon as you walk in the door. You know, I mean, I understand. Uh, I mean, I've read Michael Brown's book, you know, We Got Blood on Our Hands. I mean, I know that side of it, you know, but um, anyway, that was just a, an initial kind of a little bit of a set me back on the heels a bit when I walked in there. Begs the question, what what would have Israel's experience been had there never been a church? Yeah. Well, the thing that struck the thing that struck me was, you know, I, we've talked about this before. Is and I, I mentioned this to Fred and Rob is every it seems like every page of the Old Testament is about Israel's shortcomings. And the need for Israel to turn to the Lord, that dependency that we're talking, we've been talking about tonight. And, uh, and you know, the whole prophetic, you know, the cry of the prophets and, you know, the, um, 
we, you know, some of my favorite, you know, my favorite scriptures are like in Daniel 12, where it says when he sees that the power or when he is, when he, when the power of the holy people, people is um, shattered, shattered. shattered. Daniel 12. Seven. It seems like that's the power right there that he's he has come up face to face with as he walks in that door is it's it's somebody else's fault. It's not it has not it doesn't have anything to do with us. Even I don't know. It just seems like the. the you know, when you as you read the Old Testament or the New Testament, it's like God takes credit for everything. I mean, or blame, you know, but really credit. I mean, it's it's like he's behind all these famines and these these different things that happen to Israel. It's like, or or not, not just Israel, other other nations. It's it's not just it's not just natural causes, or it's not just this nation is a victim of that nation. <clears throat> um. You know, it says in the scripture, and, and, and when you hear the word evil, like God creates evil, and our, there's evil in a city, don't, don't think debauchery and vile immorality, please. It means there's destruction. It means there's judgment. It means there's something adverse to human, best, to human interest. In other words, something has gone seriously awry, and now we're reaping the whirlwind. We're reaping. So God creates evil in the sense of judgment. And mm -hmm. It says, is there evil in a city and God hasn't done it? The rhetorical answer is, of course, God did it. It couldn't have happened without God. A greatest evil under the sun took place in Jerusalem, somewhere around 29 to 32 AD in that area. Mm. We know that. And what, was, what did Jesus say to Pilate? You could have no power. Mm. Well, I can let you go. No, you can't, unless it be given you from above. You're going to do what you're going to do. And it's going to be in complete key in keeping with your human condition, with your own volunteerism. It's amazing. And yet it had to be just that pilot at just that time. It beggars the imagination to see God's divine setup. And yet with full respect to the issues of justice, to the issues of, of freedom, of choice and sovereignty. It absolutely no wonder people freak out and go in every kind of direction with this because it's imponderable how God can so orchestrate where had it been any other way than just so it couldn't have been just so and it had to be just so it was predestined to be just so and not because God was working with the materials and working around them he ordained it just so because why because to that was tethered and attached a glory unsurpassable optimal no no glory beyond which could be conceived that that event came to that glory just in that way at that time you can't you can't make this stuff up i mean god is god and 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 we are man and shut our mouth amen hush your mouth and so uh it's breathtaking to see the power of god's sovereignty and leaving no stone unturned of righteous judgment no one's getting a bad shake a bad deal or whatever he's taking nothing from anyone uh he you know he gives and only gives and yet if there's evil if there's anything if there's a pharaoh if there's whatever god's god takes full responsibility like you're saying not nothing nothing of this is happening without my absolute approval and agreement though i be afflicted though it break my very heart <clears throat> suffering Amen. A mystery of suffering we can't even fathom, yet I would have it no other way, because only through this and with this, take Israel on that last day. They will look upon him whom they pierced. Here's a, a surviving penitent remnant at the end of a future great tribulation, absolutely disconnected in time and circumstance from the first century betrayers and killers of Jesus. But they did it. They did it no less. There were people who weren't even in the neighborhood on the day of Pentecost and shortly thereafter. I know that, you know, and he, and he said, you did it by wicked hands. And they weren't thinking it's those guys at the temple. They're thinking it's us. And I came from Pathros or Cappadocia 
I'm here with my family. We come up to the feast, but I am the man. This is what the spirit of the Lord does when he reveals sin. It has very little to do with location, time. It's, it's, it's a revelation of the human condition and how deeply rooted it is and how estranged and utterly, we're not just injured or, 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 or infirm. We are dead, utterly far removed, without God, without hope in the world, be we Jew or Gentile. That's the, that's the dictum. That's the, the principle of the New Testament. Where was I? But, but the point of it is identification with the greatest evil under the sun. It says it was by the foreordination and purpose of God. Couldn't be any other way. Not even before the beginning. It was never a second thought. God didn't drum it up or react to something. It was perfectly ordained for the perfect outcome of an endless glory in the son of God. And yet, look at all the players and all the variables that had to be perfectly in place. Look at all the incredibly delicate contingencies. Could have been 15 other ways, but it had to be just that way to bring that just that about. You can't say that the devil's in control. You can't say free will is in control. You have to say God is in control of all of that. And yet all those things work within their, within their circumscribed orbit. And they are, they're fully culpable, fully responsible. You see what I'm saying? It's a beautiful thing to see because it because you can't see it except accept it. You'll never get to the bottom of it. You weren't meant to. You're just meant to behold something that so defies natural explanation. It defies under you know it it, it defies under. All you can do is is just observe it, behold it, and and fall down and worship, and know that you know. Aren't you glad? That something let you know that this God who made everything is a God of mercy. That he's a hear, a prayer hearing, repentance receiving, merciful God. And he will not give someone pursuing him for bread. He will not give them a stone. He can be trusted. He can be relied on. If you seek him, you will find him. I think it's a beautiful scripture. He says, when did I ever say to Israel at any time, seek ye me in vain? Now, technically, there's a few places where it talks about people who have gone so far from God that they seek him in vain, but it's because they're really not seeking him. But wherever anyone's seeking him, you can bet it's not their good idea. The spirit is drawing them. And whenever anyone seeks God, they find God. If they're seeking the true God. I saw a little booklet one time in a store uh, back in Texas when I was just really young. Right there next to it was this book called Ben Israel, The Odyssey of a Modern Jew. It was my first, my first, didn't even know about art yet. We would later find out about him, but I, I didn't even get the book. But I saw this other book there called All Men Seek God. And I started opening as a little thin booklet. It was all about all these religions and everybody, how natural and instinctive it is. Man is homo religi religiosio. He's, he's, he's naturally religious. Uh, all men seek God. And I, the more I looked at it, they're not seeking God. The scripture says you, there's none that seeks God. There's other scriptures that say you can't see God. The natural man can't receive. Can't you can hear, but he can't hear. Can't hear what he's hearing. It, it, you know, he can even he can even kind of understand it cognitively, but it takes a miracle of the spirit that he could receive it. A lot of difference. You can you can you can you can get it and not receive it. So I, I'm just amazed that that uh, that we find that that God has drawn us by His Spirit to seek Him, and uh, and to know that He's merciful, because there's really nothing in us that makes us to differ. So I'll begin all this by saying those that in Zechariah 12 verse 10 that will look upon Him when they pierced, these are people at the very end of the tribulation who are going to be completely identified. As if they had laid their own personal wicked hands and crucified the Lord of glory. Now, folks, that takes revelation. You know, it's like when Jesus said to the Pharisees, you know, you're, you're, you're the sons of your fathers. You know, your fathers are you and you are your fathers. There's a corporate solidarity here. You're made of the same stuff. You're going to, the same stuff. You're going to fulfill the same sins because that's what you are. You're the progeny. You're, you know, every seed brings forth after uh, every, uh, every tree. What does it say? Every fruit, fruit after its, its own kind. Its own kind. So you're in that continuity. You're in a continuum with your fathers. The same thing at the end of the age. And how does that come? 
revelation. Only divine revelation can put you and can cause you to look down and see the blood of God on your hands. You know, you might have been a pretty good person you know, compared with others, but that's not wise. Don't compare. We are all completely dead and undone and our lips are unclean unless we see him and are changed. And that's, that's where I think real regeneration happens. It's in connection with a, re, with a, a spirit quickened revelation. That doesn't mean you're taking biblical data in, but as you take the biblical truth in, the spirit of God lights upon it and makes it alive to you. It makes it quick and powerful and it pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit. That's where real life giving, eternity changing regeneration takes place. That's what's going to happen at the end of the tribulation to the surviving remnant that have come through so much. But what's going to make them different from the brethren that fell in the wilderness? One thing, they're raised from the dead. What does the dead do? The dead does dead things. They also were dead, capable of doing the same things the dead did and received the two, the, the, the two thirds that were cut off or the or those in the wilderness that were purged out the rebels, right? What's going to make them different that day? The grace of a, of, of a merciful God drawing them to himself with great inducements and great constraints and fury poured out, bring them to a place they would never on their own have gone or arrived, right? And then they see them. They brought, the Lord has brought them, not presto change on today's your big day, fellas, but no, they've been emptied. They've been brought through this attrition of Jacob's trouble. They've been, they've had their strength and power absolutely broken and shattered. Now they're ready to have the veil removed that lets them see him. And when they see him, they're changed. And that nation will be a nation of priests and, you know, not lordly kings, but, but servant kings, like the good shepherd David, the afflicted David, now coming into his kingdom and becoming that, that, that priestly king that can identify with, with the ignorant, the blind, and the out of the way. A priest actually, the order of Melchizedek, by the way. You see all these incredible strands come together. And, and uh, it's, it's a fateful pattern. Uh, but but that, that remnant at the end, coming to know the Lord out of absolute destitution, having the very blood of God on their hands, raised in one day, yesterday or moments ago, they were dead right now. It actually says less than one day. It says at once, doesn't it? You might throw that up sometime, not necessarily now, but Isaiah 66 verse 8. It says they're, say, they're, they're born at once, not just one day, sure, but at once. Then Zephaniah 3, 9 says the iniquity of the land is cleansed in one day. Man, this thing, when it happens, Isaiah 27, verse 9, Isaiah 59, 21, on and on, it happens suddenly and at once. Yesterday they were dead, today they're alive. Yesterday, yesterday they were a, a surviving third that hadn't yet come to repentance and faith. Today, only 24 hours later, only a moment later, they're alive forevermore. And not just one or two, you know, coming into the kingdom. It's suddenly a surviving remnant, dead one moment, alive the next, to continue for a thousand years. Wow. I got off the subject. But it just one, you know, one, one wonderful truth leads to another. But what did, what did we have to do with that? We simply received because it was open to our eyes. Our eyes, like were opened and our hearts like Lydia, the seller of purple. Other ladies were there, but only one had God open her heart that she might attend to the things. Other, other, other lepers were in Israel, but, but only one. Other widows, but only one. The election of grace. You know, that's the only thing that makes you to differ. You're, you're as dead as the rest of the dead. You might be better than some, worse than others, but you're dead. One thing it has that, that every everyday person out on a plow or in a or in a you know in a cafeteria wherever they 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 have they have that in common. They might be wonderful, decent people, and it certainly has a bearing on their eternity and how they'll spend it. To be sure, but one thing they have in common, unless they're born again, they're dead, and that's a decided disadvantage. Jesus said to some people, "You're not far from the kingdom." But what if they died there? What if they kept staying, lingering, not far from the kingdom and died just outside the door while the Lord goes and gets someone who's far off and brings them in? 
amazing. I got to get my kitty out of the room here. She's she's trapped and she wants to. I'll be right back. Yeah, I was I was thinking as Reggie was talking about um, you know that exchange between Ailey Bissell and art that he documents in one of his books. And how Ailey Bissell famously says to him, "I refuse to consider that in the face of um, you know his question to him. You know, uh, to what extent do you?" see this as you know exactly god fulfilling his covenantal word that he that he declared in the in the law of moses uh, regarding our people and he says i refuse to consider that and i was just thinking back um i don't know if you guys have ever read the book night by ad Wiesel. And ellie you, uh, sorry by ellie Wazo. yeah you you've read that night Yes. I've got it. I've read parts of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking of that that scene in there where they're in the camp and they the Germans have done a daily thing they did, make an example of one of the prisoners, and so they put this young boy up on you know on, on a gibbet and and they they hung him, and Avi Sells documenting how how he. He hung there struggling for half an hour. Right? <laughs> and, and, and somebody, uh, one of the men watching Jewish men said, good God, where is God? And, and uh, Eli Bissell points up to the struggling boy and said, he's right up there. He's, that's where he is. And that was in the moment of where he just turned away. You know, it seems like from that point on. Um, turned and yet, away. and yet, in saying that, he was closer to the truth than he'd ever been, but he missed it. Yeah, because and he mm -hmm. was really saying something so profound, almost as though he spake this not of himself, but instead of it melting him and bringing right. in the revelation of the cross, it was the ultimate hardening. Right. Yeah. Right. So he could come to a place later when Art talk asking his question. You know, I refuse to consider that. He he. He just shut shut that down way back when, and re refusing to consider that he'd refused that a long time. Ago. <clears throat> yeah. The theologian I was referring to uh, before we went on the air, he used that very example, yeah. among many others, and uh, he's come to the conclusion that. God had nothing to do with the Holocaust whatsoever. Right. Well, and a lot of Christians believe that too. Yeah. And it's especially easy to believe God had nothing to do with it if there's no God. And the great exploitation and use of the so-called problem of evil, which I used to facetiously, facetiously call the problem of evil, <laughs> but uh -huh. the problem of evil uh, has really been exploited by the devil, you know, because uh, we don't see a brokenhearted God who who is, has suffered this and endured this, even the mystery of lawlessness being played out over the many generations and climaxing in the final man of lawlessness. Well, all of that, he has suffered, not by some helpless effort, can't do any more about it, I'm limited, not by open theism or limited godhood, but he suffered it. And the only thing, it, the, the, the thing, the answer of scripture is he's endured this for what the scripture calls a far more exceeding weight of glory. In other words, I'm suffering this like the cross itself. I'm suffering an abiding cross, the condition of humanity, the condition of death, of, of beautiful things that I love and made. I'm bearing all that. Because I have in mind and I have a will and a predestined purpose for a glory that justifies our, makes necessary all of this. It's a necessary evil. God will even himself call it evil. But the end is extremely good. Now, when you take and imagine what kind of glory is coming against what kind of evil has 
in a way of speaking, purchased that or was necessary for that, better way to put it. It begins to show the magnitude of the glory, the immensity, incomprehensible. Eye hasn't seen or ear heard or entered the heart of man. Can it be so good? It will be better than best. It'll be eclipsing of any conception humans have ever had, even the best of humans, under the greatest light of God in the veil of this flesh. No one has even arrived or even come near the glory that will be revealed. It's beyond. It's beyond. What God has prepared for those who love him. Yeah. Utterly beyond. I was just sharing with some friends that were here visiting and they were doing some things with me in their viewings. And uh, I, I just began to expound on what you all heard before. Uh, what I love so well and so much that passage in John 6, it's like many others, but especially clear there, where Jesus says that of all whom the, this is the will of him that sent me, that of all, and I'm going to give you the common, most frequent translation. I'm going to give you what I think to be the preferred and more exacting <laughs> literal translation. One is of all the father has given me, hmm. I should lose not one or some translations say no one because you're thinking of humans. You're thinking of the humans, the persons he's given me. I'm not going to lose any of them, right? But, but that I should keep them that they not be lost, John 17, meaning, but, and raise them up at the last day. But this text doesn't say that. He says it, but it includes that. Certainly includes persons, but it's broader than the persons. He says that of all, not just who, but of all that the Father has given me, I should lose no thing, but raise it. Whatever thing, person, place, or thing, whatever he's given me, I would raise it up at the last day. Not anything that he's ordained that to be given to me will or can be lost. This is his will, and he's commissioned me with that sovereign power to keep that which he has committed to me against that day. Okay, now listen. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, I think it's verses 9 and 10. Throw that up. Ephesians 1, 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now, this is going to sound like restoration of all things theology. Believe me, I don't buy that. That's not what I think the scripture is teaching. But I am thinking the scripture teaches a, a restoration of all elect things. And here's why I'm saying. Look at verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now, keep, keep in mind John 6.39. And I prefer here the King James as some of the more literal having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself what is that great good pleasure that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in christ now that's not just persons that's things that's gifts that's beautiful moments that's kind sovereign things that he's given those things will never be lost they all live on and survive on and are raised again at last because they're all being gathered together into Christ. Provided this, that they are either not hostile to God, therefore part of the neutral good creation, and that they are not at enmity with Christ, but rather they are in union with Christ, are in peaceful agreement with Christ. Everything that God has given, the good things and all that he's given to Jesus, He's gathering those things into one in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth, even in him. Then he talks about the persons. That's the persons. These are the things which are more than just persons. Next verse, in whom also we've obtained inheritance, being predestined, so on, according to the purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Take that in. That's big. This, this is telling us that all the precious things that God has given that, you know, we're going to a place, brothers, where it's a realm, it's a dimension, it's real, it's concrete, it's, it's, it's bodily, it's literal, actual, but it's a realm and a dimension where the limitations of time and of, you know, he says we're going to know as we are known, uh, we're going to be like angels, we're going to govern, we're going to judge angels. Folks, this is a different realm, but in that place of glorified immortality, where he's ever before our face and we before his, we're going to have access to all that God wants us to have access to. 
And I'm not going to say that's everything, but that's certainly all things that he's chosen for us to have access to. There's going to be a cognitive ability by, by, by a power that's beyond mere cerebral, you know, brain to know and experience it and see things and value things from a divine perspective. And so that nothing that God has given to Jesus or to those who are in Christ, be it gifts, be it blessings, be it experiences, and all of it will be purged of the evil. The evil will be extracted out of it. And even if it's there in terms of memory and knowledge, it won't be there in terms of sting or of, or of death or of all the things that have to do. You're going to be enjoying a place of separation, of holy separation and freedom, utter freedom, justification, cleansing, freedom from anything dark or foul or evil. And so it's not just the persons that God has given to Jesus. It's everything God has given to Jesus. We're going to see it again. We're going to have access to it again in some capacity. It leaves a huge amount out there in mystery, and I'm not going to overdefine it because I couldn't, and I know. And this is, but 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 can you see how much is implicit in just those passages we look at? John 6, 39, and then Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. And this is more than just bringing in the sheaves and, 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 and you know, many sons to glory. This is like every holy good thing that God has done through and in his people. We inherit it. I could even go further. I could mention 1 Corinthians 3 there where Paul says, you guys are sweating who's your, your favorite teacher. Is it Paul? Is it Apollos? Is it, is it Cephas? Who is Peter? Uh, why are you occupied with that, fellas? Don't you know that whatever is Apollos or Peter's, it belongs to you? The world to come, life, death itself, it's all yours? And here you are uh, scrambling and, 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 and competing and comparing over things, whatever things they have, they have from God. One waters, another plants. They're, none of them are anything except to be the grace of God in that particular vessel. Well, even if that power and grace is not even in your vessel, in a way of saying, you actually inherit it in Paul. You're not going to be up there in the constellation of glory with one star brighter, you know, with one luminary brighter than another, look over with envy or, oh, I could, you're going to rejoice. You're going to be in an innocent, holy place. You're rejoicing in everything God did in that other vessel. It's okay. It's, it's your God who did it and you love it. You're in union with it. You're part of it. You rejoice in it, even though your own measure is, is something else, maybe smaller in terms of the depth of inheritance. Nonetheless, you inherit their inheritance. And listen to Abraham when he says, you're my exceeding great reward. And uh, how's it go? Where is that in Genesis? Where, it, where Abraham my is shield saying. shield and my exceeding great reward. How's it say that, Rob, again? My shield and my exceeding great reward. Ah, you are my shield and my exceeding great reward. Right. God is your reward. Everything in God, of God, through God is your reward. You get in on it. You get in on all the things, but guess what you else? You get God. You get God himself and his lamb and his, and his all that. We, we're going to have a veil removed here. We're going to have an open heaven. It's not always going to be under these elements of, of, of confinement and restriction. I was just thinking of that scripture in Revelation where he says, Behold, I make all things new. Like you're yeah. emphasizing that things part before, but behold, I make all things. Wow. New. Ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Oh, to believe what we believe. Amen. To really not just believe it and affirm it, but apprehend it. And moreover, to be apprehended by it. To be so free that we cannot not speak. Like the burning in Jeremiah, we can't keep silent. And not just because of urgency and duty, although that, that's absolutely there, but because of the constraint of God's love. Because we freely receive, we can't wait to give it away, you know, because we're debtors to all men. What man are you not a debtor to if, if you've been liberated by a power that's able to liberate him or her? Amen. I remember one time in my university days, I was there in fourth year and I was sitting down on a bench in the student union center there was a guy about three feet away from me on the bench 
And I was meditating in Genesis on God says, you know, name man in my image, man in my image. Just meditating on that. Say that again, Todd, uh, Rob. You went a little bit low there. What? I, I was meditating, meditating on Genesis. That part about where it says in Genesis, you know, he made man in his image. And um, I was just so moved by it. All of a sudden, you know, I was just moved by it to say, I, I turned to the guy three feet away. And I just asked him, do you know, man, why you are important? You know, and he just looked at me with a blank stare. And then he said that the next thing he said was one of the saddest things I've ever heard. He said with a, with a deadpan expression on his face, there was no put on, it was, that's where he was at. He said, I'm a fourth year biology student. All we're here for is to eat, sleep and procreate. And that was it. And I just like, this is where we've come to. I'm sure that just delights his family, his parents to just glory and him eat, sleep, and procreate, right? It was just to it's so tragic. What and a lie, just, evolution. What a hellish yeah. end time lie. Man. Yeah. You ever heard anything so sad? Just never forget that. Sure. Just the expression on his face. It was just dead. It was honest. Yeah, that's it was, all. It's true. It was and, and he pointed out why. He just knew too much. Yeah. You know? It's one of the saddest things I've ever heard. When the truth is found to be lies, I mean, there's nothing to do but despair yeah. and go uh, in hippie world, go make love or something, you know? But it's like there's nothing there. All that we thought was true. Our education has proved to us that it's all lies. So what do you do? Don't you need somebody to love, you know? Gracie Slick and the Jefferson Airplane said that. <laughs> you, 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 you kids wouldn't remember that, would you? <laughs> You're a 60s guy. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, back to the thing about Zechariah 12, and they look upon him. I wanted to cap off what I was saying earlier with this concluding point, and I do mean concluding, that God in his wisdom, will deliberately let Israel see and experience how far away they could go and they could be, despite their legal things. Sure, you've got your, your immoral Jews like you have immoral Germans or anybody else, right? But you've got people who are completely the paragons of ethical commitment, virtue, altruism, and yet the blood of God is on their hands, not on some of their hands, but on all the surviving remnant. They go apart. They can't even commune together or talk about it. They go apart to mourn. That's devastation, folks. A holy, glorious devastation. And it meet, it's answered in a glorious resurrection of a vibrant, powerful people who are so deeply inwardly broken. And they're going to bring a word. That, that, that he, and somehow the, the Gentiles, that few number that are left after the great catastrophe, are intuiting, and probably because of what they've heard from the church, they're intuiting that God is with this people that have survived this incredible conflagration. And they're saying in Zechariah 8, 23, 10 men of every nation, I could just weep every time I hear this, or get hold of a skirt of him that's called a Jew. This is not some spiritual inward this is real jew who just got through getting totally devastated broken and raised up out of the dust of death they're going to get hold of the skirt of him that's a jew let us go with you god is with you man glory glory unspeakable glory i wouldn't trade what i believe about the literal interpretation of scripture for anything Unless it be, of course, the gospel, which obviously has tremendous priority over anything else. But other than the gospel itself, the liberating simplicity of the gospel, I wouldn't trade a literal hermeneutic of reading the Bible and the plain language, a plain person's plain reading of plain language. As Fred loves to quote, if, this, if the plain sense makes common sense or good sense, seek no other sense. You know, we understand there's figurative language, but the, the, but the Jewish people... At that point, had just come to faith. You could have picked them up with a proverbial blotter. They went down in a heap. They're going apart to mourn. And now when they come up, 
the nations that know they're on their way back home to Zion with mules and camels and ships and so on are counting it privileged. These guys are survivors. They know it's amazing that they're even here to, here to see this. And then remember now, not only has the veil been lifted from the Jewish heart, I think that's 2 Corinthians 3, it's been lifted from the heart of the nations. Look at one, look at Isaiah 25, 7 verse sometime. When the Antichrist is destroyed at the same time that Isaiah himself is being raised and, and, and uh, the de death is swallowed up in victory. It says that the veil, let me put that up, Tom, <laughs> while, we're on, while we're wrapping up right way here. Let's look at that. I, of course, the context is, makes it even sweeter and better, but we won't look at the context. But look at that. And he, Yahweh, will destroy in this mountain, that's Mount Zion, the face of the covering, that's the veil, cast over all people. Well, here it is. And the veil, to Hebrew parallelism, and the veil that is spread over all nations swallow up death and victory and the lord god will wipe away tears when does that happen when he destroys the strong one the one that the Syrian that comes into the land he's going to look at that he will he will the, the rebuke of his people shall he take away from away from off all the earth for the, the, the this is so unlikely this is so improbable that god himself condescends to say for the lord has spoken it and uh, the veil is being lifted, and the Jew is standing, left standing, and the dust is settling now. Incredible education. The nations have seen this incredible, powerful figure having all power, signs. He's now, he's now been destroyed. They've seen the Son of God come in power and great glory. Uh, every eye saw him. I don't think they all understood it equally, but they saw him. He's cracked the sky. He's broken in. This is reentry. And the Jews who are, are contrite and broken, the, at the same time, this veil is being lifted from the nations. What else do we know from Scripture? Satan just got bound. Antichrist is toast. Satan's bound. Mystery of God is finished at the seventh trumpet, Revelation 10, 7. But he's declared to his servants, the veil is taken away. Now all the nations, according to Ezekiel 39, know something they never knew before. They now know that Israel went into captivity for their iniquities and the Lord sold them and, and has turned them over to their enemies because of their covenant violation. They now know what this great ancient covenant contention, this controversy of dying, they now know why that's all about. <clears throat> that's just settled. The church is translated. Can you see how these incredible things are coming together here at that time? And there's a harmony. It, it doesn't, it's, it's not a traffic jam. These things are, are clearly happening and so the, the nations count it a privilege to to assist the jews to go back home they're bringing the jews back like a sweet offering to the lord to the land uh, assisting facilitating their return by every uh, possible means of implementing every possible means of transport and they're not coming back by way of rapture they're coming over dried up riverbeds and over from distant lands and they're coming on mules and camels and ships this isn't rapture. These are Jews that just got saved. Some in Assyria, some in Egypt, some in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, and, 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 you know, I don't think there's any, I don't want to be silly, sorry. But the Jews have, have just come into a revelation of Jesus Christ. They don't have new bodies. They are in their natural bodies. We have new bodies because we already had the first fruits of the Spirit. And when that, when, when that revelation of him comes, we're changed in a moment, twinkling an eye. But they are, they are completely, have, have, they just had a revelation, and they now know the one they pierced. But the Lord let them go so, my point is, the Lord let them go so far away as to be the murderers of God, because they're the object lesson. They were the most uh, unlikely of people to do that. They had the holy oracles. That's the whole point, because what they did, we did. And would have done a thousand times over. As surely as you would have fallen with Adam, you would have failed with Israel. You would have stumbled with Israel. There is no difference here. Left to yourself, you'd have done just what Adam did. You'd have done just what Israel did. And when you look through the window of Israel and you don't see yourself, you're, a, you're an anti-Semite. You're in self-righteousness. If you don't see that what they did is exactly what you would have done under the same circumstances. Listen, this is at the heart of what Art Katz had when he was on that train when that German amputee came in. And Art's first thought, 
he couldn't light a cigarette. He's so crippled up with his, you know, with his, I forgot what kind of amputee, uh, you know, Nick. yeah, a, but prosthetics or whatever they had back then. Yeah. And Art's first thought was, suffer, you bastard. Yeah. And then all of a sudden his heart was just, he wasn't even born again yet. He was on his way, he was, he was on his search. And the Lord was certainly on, on Art leading him. But Art was just going through all these lessons, experiences, meeting, meeting um, uh, the, the little girl that prayed for him and reading Win Winston, the brother that he met in the car that said men ought, all, men ought to watch whether you guys have read, read Bit Israel. And, and so uh, there Art saying, you know, and the next thing Art, his heart's melting, that that's me. And when God showed Art, that's you. That was the, really another great catalyst in, 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 in moving him toward the, the Jerusalem bookstore where he was saved, he called on the name of the Lord in Jerusalem. But it was seeing that amputee, he said, except for dint of circumstance, but for the grace of God, or for, for just circumstance, he wasn't talking like that yet, but that's me, there go I. I could have been stoking gas chambers. This is what Paul means in, in 1 Corinthians 4, I think it's verse 7, where he says, who makes you to differ? Or what do you have that you didn't receive? Now, if you received it, he reasons, why do you glory as though you didn't receive it? Because your impatient, exacting attitude toward your brother has all to do with some presumption that you're, you, you find something in yourself that makes you differ from him. Now, he's not saying there's no difference. He's saying who makes the difference. See, that's the issue. So your ability to judge has all to do with your presumption of your own uh, advantage. But if you know that even though there are differences and God has given you good things, he has given it. It isn't you being better or doing better than they are, you know. That, that's when you can, you know, even though you can righteously uphold God's raw, righteous standard and say, brother, that's a sin or, or that's a blessing or whatever. And you can say that of yourself, but that's God. But when you're coming out of your own personal peak and impatience and demand and expectation, that's your self-righteousness. That's a huge difference. You can be a prophet. Because you're in their shoes, even though you're not practicing their sins, you identify with the, the, the ingredients by which such sins are practiced because you've been there. But, but you're not exacting of them in that attitude of self-righteous, hey, why aren't you this and that? And, you know, I'm astonished at you and all that. Rather, you're thinking God has had mercy on me and, and show me something. He can show them that. Maybe I need to pray for them while I counsel or admonish. See what I mean? Because God's the difference maker. Grace is the difference maker. These are close issues. It has all to do with, with the issue of humility. Uh, humility isn't just aiming with all your heart to get extra humble. Humility comes by one thing, revelation of the spirit. That's where humility is born and quickened and given. And it's not just by your resolve. Though that's wonderful. You need that. You need to be crying out to God for it. But God has got to quicken in the same way that he raises the dead. He's got to quicken in you a humility that is not your own humility. If it was your humility, you'd have more of the glory. You know, once a brother was famous for saying it takes God to love God. I'll go you better. Only God can love God. It takes God. In other words, it's not just a little help. It's not. It's help. It's God. Yes, he helps. But he gives you the grace so that it's actually him in you. Christ in you. To do and to will of his good pleasure. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's the doer of the word. And let me tell you, that word's got to be done. But in union with him, you're the doer. Amen. But he's the doer. And it must be done. But it only can be done in and through and by him. It's all of grace. I'm sorry we lost Fred. I know he had a lot to say, and I think I over overextending my uh, exhortation. But um, so one of the things we were hoping maybe to touch on, maybe we can, looks like we can't now because I think we're going to be going for vacation, right, Tom, during, yeah, no problem. Yeah. But uh, one of the things I'd hope we had, we could talk about tonight or at some soon point, and actually uh, had to go pick berries. I told Tom I couldn't. So I lost them in my study time. I wanted to kind of get prepared to answer a couple of questions that I needed to read about before I ventured to share it, but it's about the glory that is that really shines out of the original uh, 
first gospel, the, the proto evangelium, mm -hmm. the, the Genesis 315. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I literally believe that, that for all the volumes that have been written on that, the richest and, and you know, things that we rejoice in, I almost think the half has never been told. And I had kind of wanted to review that and get into that a little bit and look at the implications and the outgrowth of that glorious promise for that whole trail of messianic divine son, son of man unfolding that comes out of that. And how much that was the constant absorption and consciousness of the earliest prophets and servants and saints and how that consciousness and expectation went right into day, to Abraham's expectation about Isaac and his family line. And, you know, it's, it's behind almost everything. Uh, but but it's one of the most, as I've studied and kind of consulted scholarship and all, it's one of the most neglected, fought against, opposed. I could tell you, uh, but but that's not my job to give you guys all the problems that scholarship creates. But but to but to talk with you sometime about how that develops through Scripture, it is a it is a glorious thing to behold. And I, I just hope maybe some night or maybe we could even get Travis back or whatever. I would love us to go through that maybe in the future when we come back after the conference. And just to unpack Genesis 3.15. It's so rich and so deep and so full. It's endlessly unpackable. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is something. And I've just been marveling at it. And to me, it's the missing link. It like explains so many of the things that you're going to see that I believe a case can be made and I want you to be patient. We'll, we'll look at it when we, when we can. And again, we, it needs to be tested. You need to see if you concur and agree, but I believe it can be shown beyond the shadow of a reasonable doubt that, that Isaiah and Micah, they not only believe that this one that was coming was divine, but he had to be born of a virgin. He had to bypass the seed of man. He had to, uh, not only would it be a king from the line of Judah and the line of David and all those good things, but he would be that seed that would completely reverse the curse, but someone that had to come and be born, monogonesis, the Greek word in, the, in John's gospel. The reason John doesn't talk about the virgin birth is because he knew that was ground well covered in the other gospels. He, he wrote his gospel evidently later, quite a bit later. There's one guy named Robinson that he wrote his first, but whatever. But he uses this word about the only begotten son. And we think, well, God only has one special son. But the, really, the word in Greek means the uniquely begotten son. Certainly, there's only one. The, wor the word one is right in there, but it's uniquely. And that's his version of the virgin birth story. He's dealing with the fact this one without beginning of days, he was uniquely born. And he was the actual coexisting, pre-existing word having no more origin than the father, but distinct, but yet one and all those glorious things. That I'm going to say, the prophets knew that. They knew that the Messiah would suffer before he would glorify, be glorified. We, we know that John knew it. He said, this is the Lamb of God. Peter says all the prophets knew, not just some, but all of them knew one thing. And when I look at how many things, Jews and, and, and liberal Christians and even a lot of conservative Christians oppose that. But but I want to look at that sometime with you guys. And uh, uh, I've kind of lost my place. But going back, you know, only someone born of a woman who's going to bruise Satan in the head or crush his head. And in so doing, this one is going to have his personal pronoun, masculine, his heel, bruised, equally crushed and bruised. That one is going to reverse the curse. And here's the logic that I believe that all the prophets understood. I even wouldn't be surprised from Genesis 4.1 and then Genesis 4.25 if Eve didn't understand it. She didn't see the, the many things that would happen in the meantime. But the understanding was you can't reverse a fall if you're under it. Think about that. If you are born like all other people are born. If you come into this world in a way that's not unique, right? You're under something. How can you reverse it? I used to say facetiously, you know, you can't, you can't kill the snake if you're snake. But in other words, if you're under the power of sin, you can't reverse its power. And everyone born in this world, and Eve, Eve herself and Adam could look around in nature and go and recognize that there's a condition upon us that someone's got to circumvent, go around, 
the fallen nature of man. Now, how is that done? The, 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 the hints, which I think they made more of it in their constant reflection on this promise, it became more than a hint. He's got to be born in a way of a woman. He's a real human, but he's not, he hasn't contracted the fallenness that comes obviously down to the seed of man. Now, you, before you even come to Genesis, I mean, to Isaiah 7, 14 and so forth, there's an interesting passage in Jeremiah. I think it's Jeremiah 31, verse 22, 29, somewhere there. It says, behold, the Lord will do a completely unique thing in the earth. That's the word in Hebrew. It's the same in the Greek. Here's the unique thing. It's going to compass. And that's a difficult word. All the Hebrew and everybody says that's a difficult word. But it means to surround. But it can mean also to go around or circumvent. A woman shall compass a man. And he's saying it right there when he's talking about the hopeless condition of Israel. What's going to ever bring about a situation where these guys are ever going to be able to keep the land and, and have the new covenant? Something radical has got to happen. And just when you think he's talking about the new covenant, he says, no, a unique thing in the earth. A woman is going to compass or circumvent a man. This is, this is hints, sovereign hints throughout the scripture. How else did Isaiah and Micah, who lived only 40 miles apart, did they contrive together to conceive of a divine son called the everlasting father, the prince of peace? Not only is he the stem and the branch from David, Isaiah 11 and so on, he's going to be divine. And he's going to have no beginning of days. He's going to be born of a woman in a place called Bethlehem. He's going to be in David's line. But he has no origins. You know, you know, the Jews will say, well, that's pre-existence. They'll give you that. Rashi and Kimchi, they'll, they'll grant pre-existence in Micah 5.2, but they will say that's not eternality. Pre-existence, yeah, we've got a pre-existent Messiah, but not one that's eternal, co-equal with God. But the same Hebrew scholars will tell you that had, because of the limits of the Hebrew language, had that been the intention to speak of absolute co-eternality, there would have been no equivalent language in Hebrew to express it better than that. So the word is Olam, I mean, Fred would know this stuff, but the, the word is, uh, his going forth is from old to everlasting. Well, Isaiah, 40 miles apart, they knew each other. Their prophecies had a lot of common similarities. 40 miles away, Isaiah is saying, not only is his going forth from everlasting to everlasting, he is the everlasting. You see what I mean? He's the divine son. So what's David thinking about when he says, my Lord will say to my Lord and all that. He's thinking about a son in his line, far superior to Solomon or anyone. Somewhere down the line, there's going to be a son from my lineage. And he's going to reverse the curse. He's going to bring paradise back. He's going to undo what's been done by the devil. And not just what's been done by the Moabites or the Edomites or the Romans, but the devil. Right? Man, this stuff is so glorious, guys. You don't think this, you don't make it up. You don't fix it. It's just there to be discovered like riches and treasures and mine be mined out here a little and there a little. And it comes together in this glorious composite tapestry, uh, mosaic, whatever you say, you know, symmetry and, you know, get the mystery of the, of, of iniquity and the, in the, in the descendants of, of the serpent. Then you've got the, the seed of the woman, which carries the character of an Abraham and of a David, which is not perfect, but godly, alive to God, born of the seed, which is the spirit. And they, it comes to perfection in the one son who is, by, who is the product of a bypassing of man. And to this one uniquely begotten son, he gives the spirit without the measure. John 3.34, properly translated. Why? Because others have the spirit by measure, but because he was completely the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him all fullness of pleased but of him all full, have, 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 of him have, have we all received his fullness a measure he is the preeminent one to him there's no measure because there's no point of disconnect there was nothing in his flesh even that was at enmity with God is completely the the uniquely begotten one the seed of the woman so that's just a foretaste of what I hope we could track out and tread out and look at and and so on as we trace the glorious line. You know, uh, you know, Reggie. You got two mysteries. Um, you got the mystery of. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry, I, Rob. It's it's all right. I mean, 
I, I was just looking at this yesterday because I discovered this paper um, which I had transcribed with you one time or, you know, regarding Daniel and the, um, what was it called? Picture? Daniel and the big picture, right? And I noticed I was missing the last page. So just last night I'd gone and, and reprinted it so it, it wouldn't be short a page. Eh? So you went on about this exact stuff for 37 pages. Really? Seven pages. Well, I got to have it, Charlie. You've got yeah. it, right? Well, brother? you've got it. Thank you I'll for your stewardship. To you. Yeah. I'll, I'll say Well, you know, it's like it's lost. It. Yeah, I'll put it right in front of you. But 37 pages. And the last, why I was looking at it, because the last, probably from page 24 to the end, you just, it was just uh, a unique, you just shifted gears and you started talking about basically the church and believers and how we're going to traverse the end the end days you know and how we're going to traverse and all, it's, I see. And traverse. all it's formidable you know threatening and you know just it was it was just a almost like two separate pages but it was just real edifying just um the things you're saying kind of the applied it. theology of the foregoing pages right but as it's what you were be. talking about now oh, yeah. the first 24 pages were all about what you were just talking about you know, you covered that ground there for 24 yeah, the pages. So uh, you got it. So it's it's in one of those green books there. <laughs> one of the things the Lord showed me when I was a real young guy, and that is the day's coming, and it's it gets back to the vision we opened with. It really does. When I saw this thing about that brother being that mountain and the unity of the body, yeah. I saw that the Lord had it in his heart, and I had prayed this, that the generation that will suffer so ultimately in the final persecution, knowing the end of all things is at hand, that there will be a clarity. And I honestly was not thinking of two witnesses or golden oil or anything else. I was just thinking there will be a table of fat things. It would be like the, the greatest harmonization of scripture the church has ever enjoyed. And we're going to enjoy it together. Not just the erudites or whatever, but every average person. That, that loves and knows the Lord are going to have a harmony of scripture like we've never had before. That when we go into that time of ultimate crisis, we're going to be so brimming full of, of a clarity of the simplicity and beauty of the scripture. The Bible, the Bible is going to come together like all the click, click, click pieces. And there's going to be an intricate, I'm not saying it's going to be perfect or there's not going to be some differences. I fully expect that. But I mean, in large part, I believe we're going to have access to a harmony of scripture like we've never had. And that's why I probably came up with that last two pages to think this, this perspective, which is just the tip of the iceberg, is going to translate into incredible liberation and power for us to do the will of God from the heart. In those yeah, last it, that was the thing. That was the really sweet part of Daniel in the big picture. He spent the last eight or no, 15 pages talking about how believers are going to be traversing through those end days and and what's going to be made available by the Lord for believers to traverse through those days, you know, and, and it was just, I thought a real unique, like almost like two separate statements, you know, in one wow. document, you just all of a sudden started talking about how God is going to provide for us in those days and not materially in that, but just provision rising up in you know the 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 spirit of god rising up in his, his masculine just to be able to go through those days as it says the people who know their god will be strong and do exploits i think really in that first great. half of the week and, and even now before then as we see and experience and, and and hear from the lord but in that first half of the week it's like we're on that roller coaster going up click 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 and then you reach yeah. the top you know then zoom you down i've always felt that while there's a building of our faith and our our obedience and holy fear and all those good things. When we hit that middle of the week and that accuser is cast down, I've always believed that our faith is going to go through the roof, through the roof, almost like those who saw him after his resurrection and believe not for joy. Can you imagine an open heaven where the accuser can't even have access to your conscience? I mean, it's not to say you're not still a fight of faith or daily battles. I don't, I don't believe in some myth, mythical idealism. That's not what I'm saying. But such a surge of divine life and power, liberating, uh, extricating you from former weaknesses and, and hindrances. 
and you may not last long because you're probably, you know, probably not going to get martyred pretty soon it, it, anyway. But you're going to have such a surge of confidence and assurance and, and all the all the beleaguering, uh, nagging questions and so forth. They're just going to go up and smoke when that accuser comes down and, and we're seeing the fulfillment of scripture on that kind of scale, that kind of intensity. Don't tell me there's not. It's not just going to be the two witnesses in Jerusalem. It's going to be everywhere. And I believe in the beginnings, at least, it will be especially rich and deep for those that have lived with this and known it. And we're just on the shoulders of, of so many people. I, I, I never will forget this man by the name of Bauman, who wrote so beautifully about Israel and the restoration. And I thought, oh, he could have just seen uh, the restoration of Israel with all the beautiful things he said. You know what? Before he died in 1950, he did see it. I didn't know he died in 1950. But this great premillennial writer lived to see. Can you not? I tell you, it's like it's like a, a Simeon. I'm seeing the child. I'm seeing the beginning. Now, this isn't the birth that, you know, Fred and I, we all believe that the, the birth of Isaiah 66 is not 1948. It's the post-tribulational birth of the nation. We, but, but to see the beginnings of, of that kind of magnitude of prophetic fulfillment. We're talking 18, what, how long, uh, tread 18 and a half centuries since, since the Jews were illegally, they couldn't even come into Jerusalem except on pain of death. 132, I think, Hadrian came down. There was like literally hardly any Jews. And then the 11th century, there's a few, a little yeshiva there under uh, Ramban. But, but there were hardly even any Jews in Israel, not just Jerusalem, for centuries. And even when they came to Jerusalem, they weren't in Israel. And now all of a sudden you've got a, a fledgling new nation and it's flourishing and turning from total desolation to an Edenic, uh, which the Bible says when the Antichrist comes, they're going to be like the Garden of Eden. Well, that wasn't possible until modern Israel and the modern return. So don't tell me that the modern return is not a miraculous fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, it's just not quite the, it's not, it's not the, the, the fulfillment of the greater part of the scriptures, which talks about the post-tribulational return. So uh, I hope maybe Fred will touch a little of that at the conference, just to open it up, maybe for one of our table. The order of the return, very sensitive subject, but very important. Um, we're off on another subject, aren't we? So, <laughs> okay, so, yeah, but listen, guys, it's, it's just glory, 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 and we're so privileged. We're so privileged. We just don't get it, how privileged we are to even have. And I know it's only a measure, and I know there's so much we don't see. But for what we see, it's just absolute grace. Yeah. It's rare, comparatively rare in the earth. I know there's 7 million, but there's such a rarity of, of seeing, you know. And we got so many brothers that see parts and pieces of it, and that's okay. I mean, when you see, and you, if you love what you see, you've seen, and you've seen enough to love, you're in. You may not have it all yet, but you're in. But then go ahead and swim, you know, like in Ezekiel's waters. Get, go ahead and possess the land. Take some more ground. Seek him. You know, search out these mysteries. And, and uh, the Lord, I, I love it. It's in the, one of the first things in the Westminster Confession. It's strange because with all the, the doctrinal stuff and the, the creedal stuff they talk about, the very first thing is the purpose of man is to what? Do you recall, Rob, what it says? Or Fred? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Enjoy him forever. You, you could figure, yeah, glorify God, but those Puritans, they're supposed to be so solemn and serious, but man, they knew the joy. They said to enjoy the Lord. Man, I want that. I mean, I just go around sometimes. I, 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 I've doubted the worst doubts. I'm a, I'm a doubter. I'm a sinner. But sometimes I just can't stop saying, I love you, Lord. I just love you. Uh, you know, there's so much undone and wrong and not quite right, but I just love you. You're so beautiful. You're so wonderful. I've got all these questions, but you're so wonderful. And I tell you, that's enjoying the Lord, you know. And when you enjoy the Lord, he takes the little mundane, routine-ish, everyday things and invests. It takes Fred out fishing with his grandson. It invests those normal daily things with glory, absolute glory. And you just can't help but feel the tenderness of God giving you this wonderful time under the sun. You know, and we all have only a portion of time. But under the sun, we're doing this. But, but the fact that he's there in us and with us, 
turns it into into the incredible astonishment and you it's just amazing grace it's just amazing grace to be there uh picking berries with my granddaughter or fishing with your son you know man jesus is just he makes all the difference he makes everything everything beautiful you know and he even turns our sorrows and sufferings into something that you know i always told my i had a daughter that really went through some heavy things our granddaughter really and and, and she was with my daughter I, I wasn't living with them i wasn't even there they're in texas but she went through some stuff i said if you will trust god with this you know some really heavy stuff god will make it up to you he will make it up to you if you'll trust god with this he'll show you so many good things but you gotta trust him it's this mysterious stuff that happened to her that she you know and uh you know be honest with you there there may have been we don't know all this story but there looked like there was some molestation from a from a, an uncle to a person or whatever that happened to my granddaughter in texas and uh i remember telling her if you'll trust god with what's happened to you and not judge him or or anything he'll turn it for good and i've even heard other godly women who've told me that not told me but told their audiences that they wouldn't have traded all they went through because the evil they went through prepared them for such incredible good. And um, I forgot which one her name, uh, you guys would know her, but she was abused when she's a kid and she's a major famous name. Uh, and so anyhow, the point of it is trusting God with his overruling power and limitation even of evil. And boy, in some people's experience, it looked like evil wasn't very limited, right? But to be able, by the miracle of grace, to trust God with incomprehensible, inexplicable evil. And I have never seen it fail that when that rare time is when people could trust him with that, they've been greatly blessed and God made it up to them. Now, that's no human guarantee, but I believe in the word that when we trust God, God is just so blessed by that. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. When we can, and we need to ask him, because we, the power to produce that kind of faith sure isn't with us, but it's available to any of us because we ask him. When we ask him for bread, he doesn't give us a stone, does he? So, you know, it's, it's, it's always on us if we don't ask and receive, but yet by asking and receiving, we can receive a faith that can trust him with the upheavals and the evils of our lives. And when we do, he literally finds a way to make it up to us. And almost uses it as a as a as a launching pad to a higher ground. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And I've seen these higher ground Christians have often come through these abysmal, inexplicable experiences. So he's the God of all comfort. All comfort. So there is no ditch. What did Papa Pivu say, Fred, to, uh, to Corey? There is no pit or whatever. Pit so Everybody deep died. that God is not deeper still. God is not deeper still. And man, the, the tribulation saints, you're going to have to know that, aren't they, brother? Hmm. But it wouldn't be wonderful if while we're facing such imponderable things, we've got a table spread. A feast of fat things full of marrow, wine on the leaves, like Isaiah 27 there, when that that in that mountain I will make a feast. There's your there's your I won't get into that. There's your marriage supper. There's your messianic feast. It's, it's a post-tribulational event, by the way. It's in Isaiah 20, 25 or 7. And so in that area. In this mountain, I'll make a feast of fat things. Now that's the rejoicing and the jubilation of the Jubilee deliverance of the Lord and, and Israel's return and all that. But that's true here by the Spirit, you know. I've always thought it's beautiful the way in Isaiah 11, verse 10, it says that his rest will be glorious. And while I agree with commentators that that has to do with the millennial rest after the tribulation and the Jews and, you know, Christ is their rest. Yet there's something beautiful about knowing that right now, those of us who know Jesus in the here and now, that his rest is glorious. Word for word, I'm quoting. And his rest shall be glorious. And that is not true just of millennial Israel. That's true of, of uh, those of us who now can, can feast on him. You know, he, there's a rest in the Lord. It's glorious. 
hey, there's Joe. Joe, you came too late. We're about to pray and quit. So I hope you've got a, a, a sermon that's under 30 minutes. <laughs> he doesn't hear me. <laughs> okay. Now, you aren't even going to believe this, but I'd resolved before coming on the night that I was going to give, be very careful not to dominate the time. And here's exactly what I did. Well, I basically invited you to do that. Leopard can't change his spots, Reggie. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't say it wasn't without some occasional invitations from you brothers. And, I know. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. So Joe, go ahead, Bob. Hey, I just, uh, I just, I just thought I'd say hi because I guess I won't see you guys for a while. We're just funny. I just, I just started listening to you guys a little about a few minutes ago, and you were talking about the, you know, the granddaughters and fishing and everything. Yeah, we've got our granddaughter tonight overnight, so she's with us. So I've been busy all night, so I couldn't join in. She's just all over us. So oh, just, I know. Yeah. I was just thinking, oh, I gotta, I gotta get on here and just say hi before I, before we sign off, because I, I probably won't. You guys, we won't see each other or no Zoom for a few weeks. Yeah. Right. Are Three you weeks. coming to the conference, Joe? Uh, I would have liked to, but it's going to be tough. There's so much going on right now. But uh, you know what? You, you never know. So I might just pull up one day, and you'll you'll be surprised. Who knows? I, I right now I'm not planning on it, but. Uh, well, let us know of anything we can facilitate, bro. Yeah, anything it's, it's, not, it's not. It's not anything. You should be rich, haven't you? Yeah, it's nothing like that. It's just that there's I got there's so much going on right now, plans, family yeah. plans, and other things, and that. Hey, I was just going to add to that. I was just listening to the tail end of that. How you said um, that at the end of the story of all these t terrific, horrific things that we go through as saints, and not just saints, people in the world. And uh, how in the end, that God will make it all up to us. And that's yeah. you know, that's exactly what He'll do. I, you know, I just completely believe it. The, the older I get, you know, over forty years in the, with the Lord, He's never failed me, never forsaken me. He's always got me out of the mess. Most of the time, is my own mess, and He's always, always clean. You know, clean me up, fix the mess, put me on the on on the on the pathway, and and away away I go. So. God is, you know, I just, I've just been seeing the goodness and mercy of God that it's, you know, it's so good toward his, toward his people. And in the end, this world's going to go through some horrific things. We know that the scriptures are clear on it. And there's, there's some, there's some terrible things coming to the earth, but I can tell you at the end of the story, it'll be nothing but glory, nothing <laughs> but glory, man, nothing but glory, glory. We will thank God. After it's all over and said and done, we'd say, Lord, I wouldn't have changed a thing. We thank you that you've taken us down this journey because we would have never come to know who you are without you taking us through this through this wilderness and through this end time epic of, of uh, magnifying yourself. And you're going to come through and you're going to show the nations who you are. And you're going to show the nations of mercy and your love and your goodness. And you're going to Amen. see, reveal the reveal what you revealed at the cross. But it's going to be on a global, cosmic scale. The cross yeah. Yeah. is going to be epic in nature at the end, and it's going to be through Israel's coming to that conclusion, saying, it's going to "Reverberate for eternity." Yeah, we're going to reverberate through eternity. And it's going to be all based when that nation calls upon Him, whom they pierced. Oh, that's going day. to break. That's going to break everything wide open. The nations. This, the way I had a vision. You know those nuclear warhead, nuclear blasts, and you see the the shock waves just explode and reach yeah, out. Yeah. I seen that. I I, be, I felt the Lord show me that. It was like a, a when Israel comes to faith and comes to, to to their Messiah and they call upon Him with their peers. It'll be a shock wave that will reverberate through the earth. The glory of the Lord will fill oh. the earth as the waters fill the cover the sea. That that's the event that is awaiting mankind. That's Israel's destiny is. Is that that's what they're called for, and everything they've gone through, the glory will exceed everything they've gone through. Absolutely, well, it, won't even, it won't even be worthy to be compared. Nothing, you know. Wow, let's just mm -hmm. ponder that. And it's not just eternity future that that 
explosion reaches it's it's coming back it's coming back to us yeah right it's now. an implosion it's, it's, it's the x, x and the m both ways yeah it's exploding out imploding in and you know um uh, just just to see that reunion between joseph and yeah. and the and the estranged brethren i love it in micah 5 you know he's the, the brethren will return to him this this smitten ruler from bethlehem he gives them up not forever but until yeah and, and then it says at the time of travail uh his brethren return to him for now just like in zechariah 9 9 now shall he be great to the ends of the earth now from sea to sea. In other words, the one that was rejected and despised, hated by the nation, Isaiah 49, 7, 53, 3. Wow. He's back. They see him. They're 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 putty. They're putty in the spirit's hand to now become the apostle to the nations, broken, priestly, deep, deep unto deep. You know, and I they're gonna, so they're, they're not, you know. You know, one thing I, I was just going to add, I've never seen this until the other day. You know, I've, I've heard it, but I've just, I've seen it the other day. Israel, this, this Israel's calling was to give them up. As the, the priestly nation is to offer up the lamb for the nations. I've never, I never really seen it that clear that they were called. It wasn't, it wasn't nothing to do with them. It was their calling is to is to is to put that lamb on that cross for the world. That was their destiny. They, and Joe, that they would go through a pattern of darkness and suffering like his, his in the knowledge of God and the full light of the truth and the mystery, they in their ignorance would be actually living out a parallel yeah. to the my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That as a nation, they are the crucified nation. It's it's amazing. I mean, there's so many things there. You got almost have to be careful and not speak like Paul said. I've seen things about which it's not lawful to speak. I've seen things personally. I, I believe you have too. That you just almost can't say without it being an open can of worms. But there's deep things here, man, and 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 God's in complete command and control of that. And they will appear at the right time, and it will be clear. It won't lead to confusion. It won't lead to weird doctrines. You know, but there will be such a revelation. And it's so important that this is not just the one new man, but these are literal Jews that have waited and under the and under the curse uh, that are that are now the resurrected nation that will live in his sight for that three days, that third day, the millennial day. Because God will not bring a complete end until he's accomplished. You know, a thousand years is a long time. Our nation's what, 200 something years old. A thousand years is a long time. For a thousand years, Jewish people will be exalted over the other nations, not as lording it over them, but as a servant nation to them. Priests. But God requiring of the nations a respect and regard and an honoring of his election. Yeah. And he preserves them in a unique way that he doesn't even preserve the other nations. Satan is bound, a lot of things there, but they are uniquely preserved in a distinct, identifiable visibility of a very physical, real kind to make a very definite demonstration and vindication of the ancient promise. Wow. And he will not let the, the, the age end until he's done that in real space-time history on this real planet, scene of the crime, presence of the enemies right here, you know, yeah. and all the powers of the air can do is look on and be educated. Amen. You know? I, glory, I, glory. I just sent you a I, I just finished searching through multiple flash drives, uh, my own hard drive, plus a, a, a portable hard drive. I finally found it on the portable hard drive, Daniel, in the big picture. I couldn't believe how hard it was. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's gone forever. Those yeah, things like no, that but, are. <laughs> so I, I multiplied. I sent you all oh, a I copy. Oh, I see it showing up here. Yeah. I sent you all a copy, so that way it's never going to be gone, at least by me because you guys all have a copy now but that's the paper i was referring to before well you're here it was it pretty was, sure it's on the website too well yeah I, it was um 
Tom and Reggie had done a mini little hangout of their own. Oh, and you and I, I put a link to that in the description of our session tonight. So, oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Just now, just now, while you were searching for it too. Yeah. Joe, we got some good stuff tonight. If you get a chance to catch some of it while you're driving or something this week or yeah. next week. Well, I was I had it on earlier at the beginning, and there, you were you were you were rolling along pretty good. So I I just I was kind of busy. I was in and out, so I got quite a bit of, bit of it. But the last tail end here, I, I thought I I, gotta, I better get on here and just say hey, say hi to the brothers. And oh, I, if I don't <laughs> see you guys, it, you know I won't see you for a while. But you know I just felt like to say bless you guys and. Uh, you know, just if I don't make the conference, man, I just want God to just release something yeah. that he's not released. Just uh, bring something new, something, put the pieces yeah. together, synchronize this old thing that you guys have been speaking for years. May, may it just come and live and, and have That's just cool. such authority that it just re is released. And, and it's God. released with just authority that people mm -hmm. see it. There's a, there's a, there's an impact. It's, it's rev revolutionary. It's re re revelationary. It's, um, it comes with uh, just just some real mm. authority, and I just I'm just pray for that. I pray yeah. for this conference. I pray yes. that God's will would be done. That the the speakers would have a liberty to speak, and there be no no clutter mm. in their thoughts. That it would be a clear, a heavenly, prophetic word from the mm. heavens. Just a, 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 we pray yes. a, a cleansing of the heavens above that conference. Oh, the gosh. powers of errors be would be uh, pushed back. That yes. this 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 word is pure and it's uh, it's released to the church and to those who should be hearing this message. To those who need to hear it, Lord, just bring that and I just pray that in your mighty name, Jesus. Yes. Composite word, a clear word, a distilled word, a word from the many, and yet forming a a, a word. Let the many bring forth their words that come together as a word, Lord. Yeah. There even yes. be a looking at, at, a, at a mosaic that's being woven together by the different words, diverse yes. and yet saying in some essential fundamental way, the same thing, Lord. Yes. And let it be brought forth, Lord, by your mm -hmm. spirit. Shall I cause to bring forth? And Lord, I, I just ask, Lord, yeah. do more than we could even ask or think. And Lord, let Joe be there, if not bodily in spirit, Lord. Yeah. Paul had no problem conceiving of being present while certain deliberations and transactions were taking place with the gathered church at Corinth. Yeah. And Lord, may we even ask that all the servants and saints who have invested and in, you've invested in them and through them, the Saphirs and the Bonars and the, yeah. and the Barons and the Katzes and whosoever, Lord, of the many, many brethren, more than could be mentioned. God, who could be, Lord, and are looking on my old brother, Mr. Morton, Fred's precious mentor, Lord, all the different brethren who have invested and longed and waited and spoken of these things, oh God, it's going somewhere. There is an end. There is a climax. There is an appointment, Lord. And may we contribute and serve that, Lord, with our brethren. No one going out ahead of the other. No one, each of us waiting and each regarding, Lord, a complete gratitude just to be a part, Lord, just to contribute anything, Lord, or just to even be there to hear. Far better to hear than to speak if, if it be your word, Lord. Father, Lord, the privilege of just hearing your word, let alone speaking. Lord, may we treat it and see it as so holy, not to be handled by flesh or approached by flesh, but with a godly, not a foreboding, but a sweet, holy trembling that we can approach this, Lord, without, without gumming up the works with our own will, good intentions and our own slavish fears and efforts lord we are all prone to do that lord we pray you will edit us and edit this word through in each of us lord and let everyone speak in their course lord what you have given to them for that moment in time lord just meet with us there at the mercy seat meet with us now and until then and when we come together lord lord and with your spirit come together in the spirit of your holy ones in jesus name yes let it be a convocation that's holy, that's unto you, whose right it is. The gathering of the people is unto you, Lord, both now and then. Yes. In Jesus' name. I sent, I sent out a request for prayer that just came across my screen from a local pastor uh, that we know. And we know this man he's referred to. His name's John. He's a man who's 
ministered in the streets of the city, led a team out for years, minister to people on the streets, feed them, minister to the prostitutes, winter, summer for years, years. And now he's, he can barely walk anymore. He can't walk, you know, he's just real sick. So uh, you could just ask the Lord for him. Yes. If we could, guys, just yes. a real servant of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, this yes. glory, this glory that we talk about, this coming glory, is also a present glory, Lord, in eternity. You are seated upon your throne. And Lord, we, we just pray that this coming glory will rest tonight on this man, John, and on Maria, who asked for prayer. Yes. Lord, that you that you would that you would touch our mortal bodies, those of us that are hurting, suffering in the flesh, suffering different infirmities, Lord. You are you have been touched with a feeling of all of our infirmities. And I just uh, just pray that your glory of your presence will rest upon each one that's in need tonight. Yes. Yes, Lord, we just agree for John Phillips, Lord. We just claim him, claim his healing, Lord. We just ask you, Lord, that you would just release him from any other condition that she, of uh, suffering that he's in, Lord. Just a restoration in his life, Lord. Just uh, open your healing flood of the blood that was shed on the cross, Lord. Just release that, Lord. That we pray for him, Lord. He sounds like a real servant, Lord. He's done so much for your kingdom, Lord. So we ask you, Lord, in your mighty name, just release him, Lord. Give him some more time to speak your truth and to your, reveal your love to the nations, Lord. Lord, I just thank you this. And I just thank you, my God. Just really thank you, Lord. Lord, I always want to remind everybody and remind myself daily, you are good. Mm -hmm. You are love. You are just. You are righteous. You do all things well. There's no gray areas with you. You are pure love, pure joy, pure goodness. Yes, you do things that stagger our categories at times. But we know that we, once we get through, you at the other end wait for us. And we see that it's all you and it's your glory. And that we get through because of your sovereignty. And that will be like that to the end. We might go through these tough times. But in the end, we'll wake up and we'll see that you've been on the throne the whole time. There is nothing in this universe that is out of your control. You are Lord. You are at the right hand of, of authority and power over all things, over your creation, over, over Satan, over the powers, over everything. So, Lord, we just thank you for that uh, victory of the cross. And that is for us. That is for us. We stand on that, Lord. And that's for us, Lord. You've you defeated the powers for us, not for yourself. It's for us. And we ride those coattails to the promised land. Oh, God, to the promised land, Lord. We'll get through because we, we ride on your coattails. All we do is just say yes. All we say is yes, yes to you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, the name above every name, every name in this universe. Every name, every tongue will confess that you are Lord. That's, that day is coming. The nations will bow before you in reverence because of the cross. Thank you, my God. Uh, Father, your word says, how blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. The Lord will protect him and keep him alive. He shall be called blessed upon the earth. Do not give him over to the desire of his enemies. The Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed. In his illness, thou dost restore him to health. 
help them. Father, I just ask you would do your job. Lord, because you're here, restore him to help him, sustain him on his feet, heal him, Jesus. Please. Lord, I pray for the local fellowships that everyone that tracks with us is a part of, Lord. Lord, move that mountain. Move that mountain. It's not by might. It's not by power. Yeah. By your grace, Lord. Amen. Amen. Grace, grace, grace. Give your people grace to bear with one another, Amen. to intercede for one another, Lord. Yes, God. Encourage, encourage. Impart your patience, the patience that you've had with us, all of us. Yes, Lord. That that patience might move through us, Lord. Yes. Your love would move through us. Your long suffering would move through us, Lord. That's right. That's right. Yes, Lord. Your word says the first characteristic of patience that you write, Lord. Love is patient. Yeah. Oh, God, I pray for that. Just that love, God, that patient love to bear with my brothers and sisters who perhaps don't see things the same way I do. But Lord, you are, you are greater than all that. You know times and seasons. You know what is necessary for people to see that don't see things. And you have a time. God, I just pray for your mercy upon your people to, to, to uh, oh God, just give us the humility of heart that we can be taught. Help us, God, not to resist your spirit. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice. To, to Today, when you hear his voice, not to harden your hearts. God, that we would not harden our hearts. In just areas, Lord, you, where I've not responded in a timely way to things that you would want changed. Lord Jesus, would you forgive me? Forgive us, Lord, as people, Lord. We've done that. I've done that. God, have mercy on us. Mercy. Over us. Pass over, Lord. See it in us. Thank you that you do not impute our transgressions to us, Lord. Yeah. I love the song, you know, it says, See it in us. Grace, wonderful grace that gives me the time to change. See it. In us. Lord, that you've spared our lives when they looked like they were at an end at times. Yeah. As certain as we breathe, we thought it was over. And, and you've had mercy. Yes. It was time to build a better foundation, Lord. And casting ourselves on you for greater mercies. My heart is moved, oh God, to think of dear ones that are close to me, especially my brother Fred here tonight, Lord, who's got some deteriorating, dangerous things that militate against his health and i won't go into all of that lord but they threaten him deeply and and they they number his days in a way of speaking but lord we believe lord that he will surprise and it will be supernatural and you will say to the proud waves this far and no further in the name of jesus <laughs> that this will not go the way of all flesh this will not go in a progressive deterioration but you will even if it remains or you can heal it entirely, but Lord, I just believe that if it remains, it will not worsen, Lord. And He will, He will, He will see these days with us, Lord, and you will give Him the blessing of Simeon, Lord. That he's not come so far, Amen. Father. Yes. Bring forth, Lord, what you've invested in Him, Lord, over the years, what you have distilled and and, and that vintage. Uh, what's the word, Lord? That you will give Him release. Let his weakness be his strength, Lord. And Lord, just be uh, free.
to express yourself even when he doesn't know how free you are in and through him at this conference. And thank you, Lord, that we can get to see Candy this time and just bring a gathering, Lord, a reunion. Bless, bless, and bless again this time together, Lord. Mm-hmm. And let it just be the beginning. I, I even pray that there's more times like this. Mm-hmm. It's not just a final time. Grant it, Lord, that there'll be the, the beginning and, and, a, and a refreshing like we haven't seen in a long time together. Mm-hmm. We ask for the God who gives and does more than we could even ask or think, Lord. And we just trust you. We just somehow expect it, Lord. We love you, Lord. There's no one like you. Mm-hmm. You're more more and more than we could conceive or or even consider. And thank you. Is that word consider? Israel will consider. In the latter days, they will consider it perfectly. Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 30. They will consider what none is considered. And not only will Israel consider, Lord, the nations will consider. You said in Isaiah 53, I think it's 14 there, that the nations would be astonished. They would consider what they've never considered. Lord, what you have up your sleeve, what you have prepared is past finding out. It really, really is, Lord. Meet us, Lord, in these times together. Thank you for tonight, Lord, that that you didn't let this time pass without extracting from it some real measure uh, that will serve us in the days ahead. Mm -hmm. Meet us, keep meeting with us, Lord, at the mercy seat. And giving us times together, Lord, that that uh, are that matter, that make a difference, or that build us against that day when so much will be required, so beyond us. Mm-hmm. But you'll be more than enough. You are already more than enough. Our comfort right now that we'll meet those days with 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 uh, with uh, with blessing and grace is is Lord that uh, you will not fail us. Because it's not up to us. So we pray that we may be counted worthy to escape all these things. And with our families and their little ones. That you've got a way of escape prepared for us all. In Jesus name. Gotta go brothers. The granddaughter's calling. Bless you guys. Yeah, my, I got one downstairs <laughs> waiting for me too. Brother. You see all you guys. Right. Bless you. Hope to see you. you never know. I might just crawl in the guys. door. <laughs> all right Good see you uh, first hey, hey. god's foretold work first of september somewhere in there but on the uh convocation channel which you can find at mysteryofisrael.org we'll see you on the 23rd lord willing lord willing all right, all right. Amen. bye now Peace.